Time for our talk. We are here to. Uh, should I? Would you like me to? <laughs> Sorry. Is this good? Can you say testing? One, two, three. Testing. Oh, I never learned to count before. Okay. Okay. One, one, one. One, one, one. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. How's that? Okay. Starting up with an intro, Walter. Hmm? Are you going to have an intro at all? Or Pardon? Are you having an introduction? Yeah, no, I just go right into the show. Yeah, it dumps the lights. Yeah, have always liked to travel, and that includes moccasin wearing Native Americans who either walked or paddled canoes. Into the microphone. Oh, not in the microphone. Unfortunately for them, Native Americans didn't have a very good immigration policy. Beginning in the 17th century, America became flooded with Europeans who also like to travel about Undocumented. It. Yes, just as did the later arriving Africans and Asians. America's pub first public transportation started in 1630, and that was the Massachusetts Ferry be sailing between Boston and Chelsea. In the 1820s, oh, sorry. Uh, for land travel, people either walked or used animal parts. How's that? Better. Yay! In the 1820s, railroads started appearing in America. Their steam engines originally burned wood in later years, coal would be used. With the Industrial Revolution, railroads became America's first large industry. Beginning in the late 1880s, electric streetcar and interurban lines were built all over America. Tiny towns, Galbraith, Illinois, for example, got streetcar service. Electric railways grew to be America's fifth largest industry early in the 20th century. In that time period, Automobiles started appearing all around America. Oh, yeah. Initially, average Americans couldn't afford one. Autos were rich men's toys. But really scared streetcar company owners were the occasional bicycle prices. The Great Depression of the 1930s brought empty factories and joblessness to America. Much of the electric railway industry was wiped out. However, American automobile ownership continued to grow despite the Depression. In the early days of our republic, warfare depended on cannonballs, gunpowder, and wind power. 20th century warfare depended on tremendous amounts of munitions and oil. Americans coming out of the great of the 1930s Great Depression and looking to a better life suddenly found their lifestyles altered after America entered World War II. To back the war effort, Americans had to endure the rationing of food and other goods. In 1942, automobile production stopped 
as American factories became incredibly busy defense plants building a mighty war machine to defeat the Axis. The American war machine depended on an incredible amount of steel, rubber, oil, and gasoline as it rolled to Africa, Europe, and the Pacific. Under rationing, most voters in 17 states suddenly found that they could only buy three gallons of gasoline weekly. Many autos went into storage. For more than three gallons of gas weekly, a person had to have a job essential to the war effort. Gas rationing eventually spread to all of America. Lo and behold, these ancient electric interurban cars in Arusta County, Maine, became an important factor in the war effort since many motors packed their autos for the war's duration. During April 1942, the new Office of Defense Transportation, or ODT, issued an order that no passenger carrier can replace rail vehicles with buses. There were rare exceptions to the ODT order, such as when Maine's failing Bridgeton and Harrison Railroad, with a track gauge of only two feet, was allowed to shut down. There were some places where the ODT order discontinued trolley service reinstated over still intact trackage. A Buffalo, New York defense plant worker, completely disgusted with cramped, dilapidated buses and totally inadequate service to and from work, informed the ODT about unused intact trolley tracks by his place of employment that could be restored to service. ODT thanked him for the information. The man was greatly disappointed when Uncle Sam dug up the tracks and used the rail's valuable steel for a war effort scrap uh, metal drive. <laughs> There's a Boston Maine Railroad passenger train chugging along there, Peterborough, New Hampshire, home of America's first tax-supported public library, and Thornton Wilder. With coal plentiful in the U.S., and since the majority of railroad passenger trains were pulled by coal-fired steam engines, the American war machine was not deprived of oil by most passenger trains. In this country, 97% of our military personnel moved by railroad during the war. To discourage non-essential wartime travel, an excise tax was added to all intercity rail, bus, and air fares. Many troops moved in specially built boxcar-like vehicles containing stacks of bunk beds, not a very pleasant way to travel. Three troop sleepers are right behind the engine of this Pennsylvania railroad train at Chicago's Englewood Union Station. During the war, 90% of military material moved on railroad freight trains almost always powered by coal-burning steam engines. There in Wyoming is one of Union Pacific's big boys that burned 11 tons of coal an hour. New England used to have the highest concentration of industry in America. This Hill and Dale roadside electric trolley freight line in Claremont, New Hampshire, played its vital role in the war effort, trundling along through the war era and beyond until industrialists turned their backs on American workers by sending jobs out of the U.S. while also hiding taxable profits offshore. Springfield, Vermont used to be a center of tool manufacturing. That town was connected to a mainline railroad a few miles away in Charlestown, New Hampshire, by this electric railway that became another vital wartime operation. This line, along with its freight trains, had trolley cars that transported people back and forth. Now we drop down to my hometown, Boston. It seems the Boston Elevated Railway Company, along with other transportation agencies, were preparing for the possibility of war because of actions by Hitler and Tojo during the 1930s. Fifty stored out cars were pulled out of mothballs and put back to work on this line to serve the important Boston Navy Yard. The Boston L Company began carrying a record amount of passengers after the Pearl Harbor attack. Pictured as a Cambridge train consisting of what then were the world's largest type of subway car. During the war, traffic checkers one day counted more than 500 passengers packed into one of these cars. With more than 500 packed into the one car, I guess you could say that car was the original Boston Strangler. <laughs> Dozens of these high capacity trolleys were pulled out of storage to handle the wartime crowds. With full employment and automobile use way down, transit lines were heavily utilized. During the war, Boston L vehicles carried 430 million riders annually. I remember my neighborhood trolley line running cars just a few minutes a pile all day long, 
and the cars would always be packed, even with a headway of only a few minutes. In the wee hours of the morning, charted street cars packed with newspapers found fanned out all around metropolitan Boston in a desperate attempt to save on gasoline and tire mileage of newspaper delivery trucks. In the 1930s, heads of North American Transit Systems formed the Electric Railway President's Conference Committee that then unveiled a high-performance streetcar design called President's Conference Committee Cars, or PCC Cars. These cars would help tremendously with the war effort. Electric trolley buses were a great help for saving oil during the war. Boston L was allowed by the ODT to obtain 30 new trolley buses to help its existing fleet handle the war time crush. Not far away in Fitchburg, not far away, the Fitchburg and Leminster Street Railway Company operated electric trolley buses between its namesake cities. 60 pollution-free electric trolley buses serve the Boston area presently. There's Boston's historic Old North Church. The ODT then sightseeing motor buses for the war's duration. Great Line stayed in business by touring Boston with Boston on the buses. On Sundays during the war, many churches and chartered Boston L buses around their respective neighborhoods to carry parishioners to and from church services. This was another way to keep people out of automobiles and save on gasoline. The Boston Police Department, in its part, with fewer cars and more mounted officers, also having the good humor man's ice cream pack pulled by a pony, saved on gas. In 1944, the OGT allowed the Boston L to order 225 of these PCC cars, 10 of which are still in service. The cars ran single until very near the end of the war. Two and three car train operation was put off so to avoid any snafus of the untested cars that could disrupt very vital service. This train is going by Boston University, where College of Complexes moderator and Massachusetts native Karina Shushan studied and became sophisticated, just like all Bostonians, and, and, including me, of course, and Norman Porter, Jr., a.k.a. Poet J.J. Jameson, a sophisticated bard, and College of Complexes speaker and regular attendee, and escape murderer from Massachusetts. <laughs> it's a Methodist institution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we won't say the uh, Holocaust denier. We won't mention him. Uh, the giant Eastern Massachusetts Street Railway, with 1,000 cars and stretching from New Hampshire to Rhode Island, abandoned almost all of its trolley lines during the Great Depression. This route from Boston to Quincy in a major defense plant the Four River Shipyard was retained, for the line was extremely vital during wartime. At Eastern Mass Affiliate, the Union Street Railway kept its electric streetcars working hard in New Bedford during the war. Streetcars could also be found working hard in New England's second largest city, Worcester, Massachusetts. In nearby Providence, Rhode Island, streetcars soldiered on along with a fleet of trolley buses. The OGT smiled upon Providence, and 65 new trolley buses were added to the fleet to deal with heavy wartime riding. I remember seeing many trains of tank cars going through Massachusetts during World War II. The trains replaced coastal tanker ships that were vulnerable to Nazi U-boat torpedoes. I remember seeing oil slicks and debris hitting Massachusetts beaches after ships were torpedoed. I particularly remember seeing oranges floating in with the tide after one ship was sunk. Sights like that made me worry about my uncle in the Coast Guard and my two uncles in the Navy. Who's, who's of the course, who's the chick? That's no chick, that's my eight year old daughter. <laughs> of course, my uncle in the Army wasn't any safer, nor was my pilot cousin in the Air Corps. All my two cousins who temporarily gave up their Boston L uniforms for Army uniforms. Boston was one of only four U.S. cities to have extensive railroad commuter service during World War II. Those same four cities were the only ones in the country with an L subway system back then. This is North Station in Boston. It's 23 tracks extremely busy during the war. 
The majority of passenger trains serving Boston were hauled by coal burning steam engines, like this Boston and Albany locomotive heading into one of South Station's 27 tracks. On this line in 1838, regular daily riders were given discounts, or as then stated, their fares were commuted, thus the term commuter originated. This streamlined steam engine out of South Station is on the New York, New Haven, and Hadley, commonly called the New Haven. Trains in this line were among the fastest in the world, sometimes reaching 100 miles per hour only a few miles out of South Station. Of U.S. railroads, the New Haven ranked fourth in the number of passengers carried. It was a great railroad, unfortunately, raped too often by Wall Street financiers, as were most other railroads. American locomotive companies model DL-109 locomotives were among the very few diesel engines ODT allowed to be built during the war. By day, they would run on high-speed New Haven passenger trains, and by night, they would haul freight trains, being a very efficient tool in the war effort. Now we're in the New Haven Railroad's namesake city, where the company owned the local streetcar system. That came about because the great J.P. Morgan, boss of the New Haven Railroad, was obsessed with buying every transport system in the world. Here at New Haven Union Station is a New Haven Railroad electric locomotive beginning to speed a passenger train to Manhattan. Overhead wires carry alternating current at 11,000 volts. The New Haven, back in 1907, pioneered the concept of high voltage AC powered mainline railroad trains. A few years ago, College and Complex of Regular Attendee Francisco Aguilar returned from a vacation in Spain marveling over the wonderful European railways. Once, but sadly no more, American railroads led the way in speed and innovation. This New Haven train heading for Grand Central Terminal is in the Bronx on the New York Central's 660 volt direct current line. Starting way back in 1907, the wave and engine then by remote control could lower raise pantographs and third rail pickup shoes at speed. These trains could operate on both the New Haven's 11,000 volt AC or the New York Central's 660 volt DC. To supplement a locomotive fleet overburdened by heavy wartime traffic, ODT allowed the New Haven to purchase 10 of these powerful electric freight locomotives based on a proven 1938 passenger locomotive design. Unproven designs were not allowed by ODT. Now we're in College of Complexes Bible pumping moderator Brown Vasquez hometown. Yay! New York City, one of the four American cities to have an L subway system and extensive railroad commuter service during the war. This view looking down onto Penn Station track that shows trains of the Pennsylvania Railroad, the New Haven, and the Long Island Railroad. The Pennsylvania Railroad adopted the 11,000 volt AC system and an increments during the 1930s electrified its lines from New York City to Philadelphia, then south to Washington, and west to Harrisburg, creating America's largest railroad electrification, totaling 600 route miles. The Long Island has a main line stretching from New York City to Montauk with many branches. Starting as early as 1905, it electrified 125 root miles. That is 650 volt DC third rail system. The Long Island carries more passengers than any other American railroad. The two men, on August 8, 1942, two men were executed because of the June 13, 1942 ride on the New Haven from Amagansett to New York City. Their previous ride is in a Nazi U-boat, and there in America, Salvatore is determined to destroy defense plants in the New York City area. Two companion spies are sent to prison. The Long Island had plenty of coal-burning steam engines during the war and for a decade after. Here at Grand Central Terminal, we find the New York Central. That road electrified in Manhattan due basically to a New York City smoke abatement ordinance. Beginning in 1904, 95 root miles were electrified at 660 volts PC using an underrunning third rail system, a system whereby pickup shoes of trains run along the bottom of third rails, unlike the usual practice of shoes running on the top of third rails. Every year, many thousands of freight cars were floated over New York City's harbor, harbor and rivers, kept very busy by several railroads 
or tugboats such as these of the such as these such as these of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. Along with railroad trains, ferry boats played an important role moving New York commuters during World War II. This Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Hudson River ferry is arriving in Manhattan from Hoboken, New Jersey. Manhattan, Hoboken, Jersey City, and Newark are all connected by the Hudson and Manhattan Railroad, a 600 volt DC third rail line, aka the Hudson Tubes. The railroad, now publicly owned, is known as the Port Authority Trans Hudson, or PATH. Today, all New York railroad commuter services are publicly operated, just like railroad commuter services everywhere else in America. This public service coordinated transport trolley is making a very steep climb up to New Jersey Palisades from the Hoboken Ferry Slips to Jersey City. PSCT operated a vast streetcar and bus system covering North Camden, Jersey City, Hoboken, and many other New Jersey towns. It had a large fleet of dual mode buses called all service vehicles that could run at 600 volts DC electric power or gasoline. Visible below is the station where commuters transferred from the Hudson tubes, trains, and ferry boats to commuter trains of several railroads serving various points in New York State and New Jersey. Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Electric trains ran from Hoboken out to the New Jersey towns of Gladstone, Dover, and Montclair. These lines, originally electrified in the 1930s at 3,000 volts DC, were upgraded to 25,000 volts AC under public ownership in 1984. The Public Service Coordinated Transport operated a trolley cars through North City Subway situated in the bend of the former Morris Canal. Until 1952, the subway had branches running to various towns, including Bloomfield, pictured here. On Staten Island, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Staten Island Rapid Transit main line and two branches were electrified in the 1920s. The cars were designed for operation on the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Corporation subway lines. The B&O plans a tunnel under New York Harbor and connects Staten Island trains to the BNT in Brooklyn. Legend has it that the tunnel plan was killed by New York Governor Al Smith, who had holdings in the B&O competitor. Now publicly owned, the Staten Island main line still operates, unfortunately, the two branches abandoned passenger service. During, during the war, the publicly owned New York City subway and L system was very heavily patronized. On some days, the trains carried more than 8 million passengers. Even today, the system carries more than 5 million passengers daily. The huge trolley system of Brooklyn and Queens came into public ownership in 1940. The system's many hundreds of streetcars, including 100 PCCs, did an admirable job moving wartime crowds along with a fleet of trolley buses. Many privately owned Third Avenue transit system streetcar lines operated in Yonkers, pictured here, White Plains, and Mount Vernon. Third Avenue operated in Manhattan, where overhead trolley wires were banned, necessitating the use of an underground conduit system. Cars westbound of 42nd Street, west of 5th Avenue. Third Avenue also operated in the Bronx. I give a Bronx cheer to the late mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia. He engineered the demise of New York City's pollution-free electric streetcars. The Queensboro Bridge Railway operated trolleys back and forth high above the East River from Queens Plaza to Manhattan. The line served Welfare Island, now Paul Roosevelt Island. Elevators connected the island with the trolleys. By the way, elevators move more people than any other form of transportation. New York City wasn't the only town in the Empire State to have a subway. Rochester had a subway from 1927 to 1956. It was built in an abandoned section of the Erie Canal, and of course, that subway carried crushed loads during the war. The subway did a lively freight business. Four interurban lines fed into the subway until they were killed by the Great Depression. That left New York State with only one remaining passenger interurban, the Jamestown Westfield and Northwestern, which of course became a vital part of the war effort. Philadelphia was one of four U.S. cities during the war to have an out-subway system, along with an extensive railroad commuter network. 
back then Philadelphia had a huge street pass system supplemented with trolley buses. Most Pennsylvania trolley lanes and many in other states have a broad gauge of five feet, two and a half inches. This was done to keep trolley companies from interchanging freight cars with railroads, having a standard gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches. Municipalities didn't want freight cars on their streets. Some white transit workers in the city of Brotherly Love went on strike rather than work alongside blacks hired during the war. Immediately, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt personally stepped in and the work stoppage abruptly ended. Today, Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, or SEPTA, still operates streetcars in Philly along with a few trolley buses. Philadelphia's large Fairmount Park had its own trolley system. The pleasant rides through the park and across the Strawberry Mansion Bridge Uses to cooperate. Change trains. Well, hell with it. <laughs> Goodbye. We'll go to this one. Uh, further, <laughs> across. Yeah, uh, west of the city, the Philadelphia Suburban Transportation Company operated several heavily used trolley lines, two of which are still operated by SEPTA. The high-speed Philadelphia Western Third Rail line ran from Philadelphia to Stratford and Norristown. SEPTA still operates the Norristown route. The Lehigh Valley Transit used to operate speedy interurban paths north from Philadelphia to Allentown. LBT Interurbans also ran from Eastern Picture near west of Bethlehem and Allentown. The LBT operated very much needed wartime streetcar service in Allentown, Picture near and Bethlehem plus Eastern. The Pennsylvania Railroad operated several commuter lines in the Philadelphia area, most of them electrified at 11,000 volts AC. Also, the Reading Company operated several 11,000 volt AC commuter lines out of Philadelphia. Today, SEPTA operates the city's large commuter railroad network. The Rock Island Line is a mighty good road. The Rock Island Line is the road to ride from Chicago to southern suburbs such as Blue Island and Joliet. Chicago was one of four American cities during the war with both an L subway system and extensive railroad commuter service. The Pennsylvania Railroad ran commuter service out from Chicago to several Indiana points. The New York Central operated commuter trains between Chicago and Elkhart, Indiana. The, the former Pennsylvania Railroad and New York Central commuter services no longer exist. The Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy <coughs> provide an excellent commuter service southwest to Aurora. There's Hinsdale getting dusted with a cold smoke. The Milwaukee Road ran suburban service to the north and northwest, pictured as one of its trains at Mayfair Crossing. There's an outbound Chicago Northwestern Suburban train at Mayfair. That road's suburban trains ran west, northwest, and north out of the city carrying 65,000 commuters on weekdays. Northwestern commuter trains ran as far out as Williams Bay, Wisconsin, hometown of College of Complex, the pseudo-intellectual Ernie Norman. <laughs> <laughs> the Illinois Central's commuter service was electrified during the 1920s because of the Chicago smoke abatement ordinance. That very heavily utilized service was electrified at 1500 volts DC. The IC was very loyal to its coal industry customers. Back in the 1940s, the railroad's ads seemed almost apologetic about having a few oil-burning diesel engines on its roster. Chicago South Shore and South Bend, America's last surviving interurban, used the IC's electrified tracks to enter downtown Chicago. On the South Shore Line train's eastbound journey from Chicago, it would trundle through the streets of East Chicago, through the streets of Michigan City and South Bend streets, a typical old-time interurban fashion. Street running still exists in Michigan City. The South Shore Line built up a substantial freight business. South Shore Passenger Service survives today in the public operation. The freight service is, private, is privately operated with diesel engines. Chicago once had the world's largest streetcar system. With 1,000 miles of track 
and more than 3,600 trolleys, providing a great level of service unmatched anywhere. Each rush hour, 30 different streetcar routes of the Chicago surface line squeeze into the loop. The CSLs, guys, and buses gave more than 900 million rides yearly during the war. 75% of the system operated 24 hours a day, giving vital wartime service to industrial plants such as Western Electric's Hawthorne Works, pictured in the background. And, of course, the very important steel mills got a high level of vitally needed service. Chicago was hog butcher for the world. Presumably the pigs did drive on that streetcar. In 1936, the CSL received 83 PCC cars known as Blue Goose, although they were actually Buckingham Gray. CSL President Guy Richardson wanted to buy another 1,000. CSL, the CSL management was outraged during World War II when OGT official Guy Richardson, the former CSL president, denied CSL's request for new CCCs. During World War II, CSL had 152 trolley buses in service. Trolley buses could also be found in Rockford, Illinois back then. On December 1, 1942, the OGT ordered CSL to reduce bus mileage by 20%. This gas station at Kedzie University, one of many closed for the war's duration, got decorated with trolley wires and the place became a parking lot for trolley buses that then weren't required to travel back to their garage to lay up, thereby saving on tire mileage. When America entered World War II, CSL had 219 gasoline buses. OGT allowed the addition of 101 gas buses and six diesel buses. In 1942, OGT canceled CSL orders for 134, 130 more buses from five different manufacturers. 20 Mack buses were delivered to CSL in 1942. However, Chicagoans didn't get to ride in the Max because ODT ordered those buses away to systems in Virginia, New York, and Massachusetts. Pictured as a 1944 CSL White Motors gas bus. This survives at the Illinois Railway Museum in Union, Illinois. During the war, Chicago's oat-eating during the war, Chicago's oat-eating dray horses had no fear of replacement by gas guzzling delivery trucks. The conductor and motorman of the streetcar on 79th and Western are ready to leave for the lakefront. Only men operated Chicago's buses, trolleys, and L trains. Chicago was unlike other cities where women were hired for transit work to overcome the manpower shortages created when men went off to fight in World War II. During the war, Chicago Motor Coach Company had about 600 buses in service. It also was mandated by the OGT to reduce bus mileage by 20%. Wartime streetcar and bus service operating in several western suburbs by the Chicago and West Town Railway was heavily patronized. This car is on its way to Brookfield Zoo and is southbound on Des Plains Avenue at 31st Street in Riverside. To the south, heavy wartime riding kept the Orient streetcars and trolley buses very busy. During the war, Chicago Rapid Transit Company carried more than 150 million riders yearly on its dependable L trains. Of its 1,500 cars, only 456 were of steel construction. The rest were wood. That's an Evanston Express rounding the Sedgwick Station curve. Subway construction began in Chicago during 1939. Despite wartime labor and material shortages, Chicago was able to open the State Street subway on October 17, 1943. 455 steel cars are round up and placed on the Ravenswood Inglewood line and the Howard Jackson Park line, both of which started running through the new subway. Practically unnoticed because it usually operated at night was the Chicago Rapid Transit's freight train operation in the city's far north side and Evanston. Chicago Roar and Elgin Interurban ran very frequent service between the city and many western suburbs. Its passenger and freight trains were powered by an uncovered 600 volt DC third rail, something almost unthinkable today when you consider that the suburbs are now heavily populated. Here's one in Chicago North Shore and Milwaukee's Electroline, is southbound on the north side of Edgewater. 
commonly called the North Shore Line. Its interurban train and route from Chicago to Waukegan via its shoreline route is trundling along Greenleaf Avenue and Wilmette, serving both the Army's Fort Sheridan and the Great Lakes Naval Station. The line was very busy. The North Shore Line's local streetcar service in Waukegan was very vital during the war since it served the Great Lakes Naval Station. There's a southbound train on the heavily patronized high-speed Smoky Valley route at Glencoe. The North Shore had an east-west line from Lake Bluff to Bundle Line and pictured on it at Libertyville as a Smoky Valley route train from Chicago en route to Bundle Line. Here's a Milwaukee to Chicago train stop at Kenosha, Wisconsin. Birthplace of our own College of Complexes, beautiful lady Kay Myers. During the war, trolley buses provided almost 100% of Kenosha's transit service. North Shore Line pioneered piggyback service between Chicago and Milwaukee way back in the 1920s. During the war, these North Shore Line trains kept a lot of trucks off highways with the great savings of fuel and tire mileage. The North Shore Line operated local streetcar service on its tracks from Milwaukee's south side. Now we'll take a fast look at electrified railroads, not previously mentioned that were running back during World War II. Unfortunately, none of the following electrification still exists. The Boston and Maine had an eight mile long, 11,000 volt AC electrification in western Massachusetts. Steam trains with the engine throttles closed to reduce smoke emissions were pulled through the five mile long Hoosick Tunnel by these electric locomotives. Post-war widespread use of diesel electric locomotives brought an end to the Boston and Maine electrification. Of course, we all know that diesel fumes in the tunnel are not harmful to human beings, right? The Virginian also chose the 11,000 volt AC system when it electrified 135 miles from Roanoke, Virginia to Mullen, West Virginia. We have a change here. By the way, those railroads had a the voltage, the AC voltage was at uh, 25 cycles, not the usual 60 cycles. Today's are. That's for you tech people. Huh. <laughs> An off open western went the 11,000 volt AC route when it electrified 56 miles in West Virginia. The Norfolk and Western was very loyal to its coal industry customers and continued to build coal-burning steam engines and its Roanoke shops to as late as 1952. To have electric locomotives bring trains through the eight-mile-long Cascade Tunnel, the Great Northern electrified <coughs> 73 miles from Skokomish to Wenatchee in Washington at 11,000 volts AC. Great Northern de-electrified and it discovered that diesel fumes in the tunnel won't harm human beings. Actually, only a limited number of trains spaced hours apart are allowed in the tunnel today because of dangerous diesel fumes. The Cleveland Union Terminal electrifies 3,000 volts DC with the passing of the smoke abatement of ordinance in its home city. Also electrified at 3,000 volts DC was the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific, commonly called the Milwaukee Road. It electrified 663 route files, one section from Arlington, Montana to Avery, Idaho, and another section in Washington from Otello to Black River with branches to Seattle and Tacoma. Pointing up the unfortunate non-standardization of U.S. railroad electrification with the 3,000 volt DC Milwaukee Road right alongside the Butte, Anaconda, and Pacific electrified at a different DC voltage of 2,400. While Westinghouse Electric promoted alternating current, General Electric promoted direct current. Also electrified at 2,400 volts DC was the St. Clair Tunnel Company that operated between Port Huron, Michigan, and Sanya, Ontario. Knowing that diesel fumes in the tunnel will run humans, it de-electrified. To the south, the New York Central's Detroit River Tunnel Company, operating from Detroit to Windsor, Ontario, was electrified using an, under an underrunning 650 volt DC third rail system. The electric third rail was scrapped because, after all, diesel fumes don't run humans. 
<laughs> but they, you know, pioneered mainline railroad electrification in 1895 when it electrified its Baltimore tunnels with a 650 volt DC trolley wire system, soon converted to third rail. With plenty of hydroelectric power available, the Niagara Junction electrified 11 miles at 650 volts DC in Niagara Falls, New York. On rail diesels took over in 1979. In New Jersey, electric commuter trains of the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore lines operated between Camden and Millville. 600 volt DC third rail operation began in 1906 by the West Jersey and Seashore, its predecessor. In Mishawaka, Indiana, the little twin branch railroads, electric locomotives, took on added burdens for the war effort. Now a fast look at World War II into urbans that managed to survive the Great Depression. Those that did usually lasted into the 1950s. They usually operated at 600 volts DC, but some used higher voltage. The majority of them interchanged freight cars with steam railroads. We started in Pennsylvania with the broad gauge West Bend railways that meandered throughout the hilly area southeast of Pittsburgh. Also in Pennsylvania was the Lackawanna and Wyoming Valley, a high speed third rail line that ran between Scranton and Wilkes Berry. Being standard gauge, it developed a good freight business. Down in Maryland, we find the Baltimore and Annapolis, owned by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Also in Maryland, we find the Hagestown and Frederick serving those two towns plus Williamsport and Thermont. It even had a ghost story. One cold January night in 1936, passengers waiting in the Mount Lena Depot heard a trolley go by but did not see it, a ghost car. Here's what caused the very strange event. A car descending South Mountain ran away out of control because of slippery rails. It hit a very sharp curve and the car body separated from its trucks. Only two persons were on board, the motorman who was injured and an off-duty company employee who was killed. The car's two trucks kept on rolling clickety-clack down the mountain track, sounding, sounding just like a complete trolley car, thereby creating the ghostly phenomenon. The Piedmont and Northern, controlled by the Duke family, famous for tobacco and electric power, had two disconnected sections that were kept disconnected by rival steam railroads, political problems. This train is at Charlotte on the North Carolina section. The Duke Power Company ran a trolley bus system in Greensboro, North Carolina. These trains are on the South Carolina section at Greenville, where Duke Power operated trolley buses. Piedmont Northern ran a successful freight business with powerful electric locomotives. There's the Youngstown and Southern, Ohio's last interurban with passenger service. The Midwest was once crisscrossed with electric interurban lines. The Great Depression killed most of them. But Toledo and Eastern survived through World War II and beyond as a freight only line. In Fort Wayne, Indiana, the Indiana and Michigan Electric Company's freight line was a remnant of the Indiana Railroad Company's vast statewide interurban system killed by the Great Depression. And the far-flung Illinois terminal connected Peoria, Decatur, Bloomington, Danville, Champaign, Springfield, Alton, and Granite City to St. Louis, Missouri. This interurban developed a very heavy freight traffic. The IT crossed the Mississippi River via its McKinley Bridge and had a stretch, a stretch of elevated track in St. Louis. Trains to St. Louis terminated in the company's own subway there. Along with electric locomotives, the IT also operated steam engines on freight trains. It had a bus system that served several Illinois towns. Seven Iowa and Turban survived into the World War II era, the Fort Dodge, Des Moines, and Southern Pitchin, the Des Moines and Central Iowa, the Child City Western End, the Waterloo Cedar Falls and Northern, which like most interurbans operated buses, also surviving was the Cedar Rapids in Iowa City, today a successful diesel freight road. Also the freight only Southern Iowa at Albia and Centerville operated during the war. The freight only Mason City and Clear Lake is today operating as, the Iowa, as Iowa Traction and it is the only common carrier 
electric freight train operation left in America. The locomotive is pictured in Clear Lake where a plane crash killed young singers Bobby, Buddy, Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper in 1959. In Kansas, the Kansas City Core Valley survived as a freight only road as did the Hutchison and Northern. Here in Independence, Kansas, is a car running on the Union Electric that stretched from Parsons, Kansas to Nevada, Oklahoma. Only the most ardent trolley fan would take the 77-mile, four-hour trip from end to end of one of these trolleys, not much more than a city streetcar. The company operated local streetcar service in, Kansas, in the Kansas towns of Independence, pictured here, and Coffeyville. In Oklahoma, the Sand Springs Railway, owned by an orphanage, operated from its namesake down to Tulsa. The Sand Springs did a very good freight business, as did the freight only Tulsa support the Union Railway. This former Rockford, Illinois trolley is on the Oklahoma Railway Company interurban system that fanned out from Oklahoma City north to Guthrie, west to El Reno, and south to Norman, a latter line very important since it served Fort Sill. The company operated local streetcar service in Oklahoma City. This Texas electric car is pictured in Denison before starting its southbound 77-mile trip to Dallas. Just after starting its 97-mile southbound trip to Waco, this Texas electric car is hindered by a derailed Dallas streetcar. Also surviving during World War II was the Houston North Shore owned by the Missouri Pacific Railroad. Its 34-mile line from Houston to Goose Creek opened in 1927 being the very last interurban built in America. For the war effort, the Salt Lake in Utah, in a rundown condition, had to keep operating south from Salt Lake City to Payson. Salt Lake Garfield and Western operated from Salt Lake City west 16 miles to the Salt Air Resort on the Great Salt Lake. The Bamberger Railroad operated from Salt Lake City north 34 miles to Ogden, Utah. One of the Bamberger's five bullet cars bought secondhand from the upstate New York's dieselized bond of Johnstown and Gloversville is pictured in Ogden where a connection was made with the Utah-Idaho Central Interurban that reached Preston, Idaho via a very mountainous serpentine route. Pictured in Oakland, California is the Sacramento Northern, owned by the West Western Pacific Railroad. This lengthy interurban operated north to Bakerville Sacramento, Woodland, Marysville, Yuba City, and Chico. With the 1939 opening of the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, SN began running passenger trains to downtown San Francisco. Unfortunately, all intercity passenger service was disconnect, discontinued in 1949, before 1941. But for many years after, SN would let trains and retired cars be chartered. SN trains were ferried across through Sun Bay on the company's boat for a moment. The SN had to keep a little passenger car running in Yuba City to protect this franchise there. Also in Chico, the franchise car. By far, the gigantic Pacific Electric overshadowed all the interurbans. Its network centered in Los Angeles stretched eastward past San Bernardino, south to Long Beach and San Pedro, north through the San Fernando Valley, and west two communities on the Pacific Coast. Owned by the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Pacific Electric enjoyed a healthy freight business. The PE operated local streetcar service in several towns and a very heavily used suburban service. From 1925 to 1955, some PE lines fed into the company's mile-long Los Angeles subway. In 1940, PE bought the largest PCC trolleys ever built. All 30 of these fine cars were sent to Argentina after the subway closed in 1955. Now look at the unsung heroes of the war effort, the streetcars and their cousins, the trolley buses. During the war, streetcars could be found in Schenectady, pictured here, and also in Buffalo, New York. In New Jersey, streetcars with the Pennsylvania Railroad's Atlantic City and Shore could be found carrying heavy loads in Atlantic City. The company had a third rail line running from Atlantic City to the resort town of Ocean City. In Pennsylvania, streetcars could still be found in Scranton, shown here, and also in Wilkes-Barre. The Reading Street Railway Company in 1952 went to court and successfully eliminated 
its franchise requirement to operate streetcars for 999 years. Trolleys could be found in Ephraim during, Ephrata during the war, and also in Lancaster and the chocolate candy town of Hershey. In Altona, they could be found in there and the neighboring Golden Valley towns. Also in Johnstown, where we find this incline railway that still operates today. Hilly Pittsburgh and many incline railways, some of which still operate. Pittsburgh Railways had a very large and busy streetcar system during the war. The company had interurban service out to Charleroi and also to Washington, Pennsylvania, where it operated a local streetcar service. <coughs> Baltimore had a very large broad gauge streetcar system and a trolley bus fleet. This two car trolley train is on Baltimore's Sparrows Point line, a very important line. Steel mills were located at Sparrows Point. Washington, D.C. had a large and very busy wartime streetcar system. There's a streetcar going right by the White House. Overhead trolley wires were banned in the innermost part of the District of Columbia. The, the underground conduit system could be troublesome, especially when a current collection device known as a plow broke off of a car. Washington's car lines reached into Maryland and Virginia. During the war, streetcars could be found in Richmond, Virginia. Back in 1888, this became the world's first city to have a standard, <coughs> practical, successful, ongoing trolley line. Also, wartime trolleys could be found in Norfolk, Virginia. In Hilly, West Virginia, the electric power company, Monica Hill, West Penn Public Service, gave good local and interurban services to Fairmont and Foxburg. In 1944, the Securities and Exchange Commission, in accordance with the Public Utilities Holding Company Act of 1935, ordered the power company to divest of its railway operations, which were turned over to the new city lines of West Virginia. This act of 1935 affected many power companies and unfortunately for passengers brought a premature end to a lot of quality rail service. To the west, the company had a separate division that operated in the Pakistburg area with one interstate route to Marietta, Ohio. In West Virginia's largest city, employees of the bankrupt Wheeling Traction during 1933 bought that company 66 streetcars and 52 miles of track for the bargain price of $76,000, then renamed the operation Cooperative Transit. At the southern tip of West Virginia, Tri-City Transit kept trolleys running between Princeton and Bluefield for the war's duration. During the war, trolley cars were still operating in Atlanta, Georgia, along with trolley buses. In Florida, municipally owned streetcars could be found in St. Petersburg. Streetcars could also be found in Tampa, Florida, and in Birmingham, Alabama. In 1915, young Birmingham residents Julian Dash, William Johnson, and Erskine Hawkins penned a tune that later was called Tuxedo Junction, being named after the Tuxedo Park Junction of Birmingham Streetcar Routes 5 and 7 at 20th Street and Ensley Avenue. Both streetcars and trolley buses could be found in Memphis during World War II. At Chattanooga, where wartime streetcars operated, the Lookout Mountain Incline Railway afforded spectacular views for its passengers. The incline still operates. Cincinnati, Newport, and Covington operated trolley cars between its namesake cities and a few other towns in Kentucky. This, the car, this car pictured in Covington, Kentucky, has just left Cincinnati, Ohio, and crossed over the Ohio River via the historic Roebling Bridge. The company also operated trolley buses and interstate service. Cincinnati, Ohio, had a broad gauge streetcar system plus trolley buses. Under Cincinnati streets lies an unused, almost completed subway. Work on it stopped because of poor economic conditions in the Great Depression. Dayton had streetcars. It also had trolley buses and still does. Columbus had broad gauge streetcars and trolley buses during the war. Cleveland had a large and heavenly patronized streetcar and trolley bus system that became municipally owned during the war. 
During the war, a scale shaker heights took over the trolley lines that connected it to Cleveland. Today, the lines are operated by the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority. Toledo had both streetcars and trolley buses during the war. Up in Michigan, the large, innocently owned Detroit streetcar system was very busy during the war since automobile factories became vital defense plants. Down in Indiana, where College of Complexes iconoclast Bill Went and College of Complexes lunatic fringe specialist Bob Manor were born. <laughs> <laughs> Streetcars could be found in Indianapolis along with trolleybuses. Streetcars still ran in small town Marion during World War II. Steel mill workers kept Gary Streetcars busy during the war. While Gary made steel, Milwaukee made beer. During the war, the, the Milwaukee Electric Railway and Transport had a large streetcar system supplemented with trolley buses. This system was one of the many that were broken up by the Securities and Exchange Commission. The company started subway construction west of downtown Milwaukee. The Great Depression killed the project with little work done. The company operated heavily patronized interurban lines to Waukesha, Hales Corners, Port Washington and Kenosha. In 1939, electric freight train service continued to operate when the municipality of East Troy took over the Milwaukee system's abandoned trackage connecting East Troy to McGuanago. A line exists today as an operating trolley museum. In Minnesota, Minneapolis and St. Paul had a heavily patronized wartime streetcar system operated by the Twin City Rapid Transit. The Minneapolis Filtration Railway's trolley cars stayed very busy during the war. In Iowa, wartime street cars could be found in Sioux City and also in Des Moines. Des Moines also had trolley buses. You don't have to go to San Francisco for a cable car ride. Just, just go to K College of Complexes, regular attendee Tony Bonds old neck of the woods to view and hop on the Fennellan Place Elevator Company ride. The upper level turnstile was originally used at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. In St. Louis during the war, a large streetcar system with an unusual track gauge of 4 feet 10 inches could be found. Closed in 1939 and reopened in 1944, St. Louis Waterworks Railway was for use by Waterworks employees, presumably the gentle. Previously, the general public was allowed to ride on it. In northwest Missouri, trolley buses could be found at St. Joseph during the war. Kansas City Public Service streetcars could be found serving both Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri, along with trolley buses. Trolleys of the Omaha and Council Bluffs Street Railway served Omaha, Nebraska, pictured here in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Here is the actual streetcar named Desire, rolling along in New Orleans. New Orleans had a large broad gauge streetcar system supplemented with trolley buses. In Shreveport, Louisiana, 98% of transit service was provided by trolley buses. In Texas, El Paso had a wartime streetcar system. Its route to Juarez, Mexico, was the most heavily used trolley line in North America. Also, streetcars could be found in Dallas, Texas. War or no war, Texans need their beer. In San Antonio, this Texas transportation company, Electric Locomotive, was kept very, very busy switching many cars of beer at the Pearl Brewery. In 1928, San Antonio became America's first large city to switch from streetcars to buses. Moving north to Colorado, we find wartime narrow gauge streetcars active in Pedlo and in College of Complexes regular attendee Margaret Aguilar's hometown of Denver. Yeah. Denver also had a trolley bus system. Both narrow gauge and standard gauge interurban lines ran out from Denver to Avada and Golden. To the north, we find municipally owned streetcars working hard in Fort Collins for the war effort. There's a real grandson of the narrow gauge galloping goods towing its wartime bit by moving people and goods to the wilds of Colorado. Uh, Margaret isn't here tonight, but she tells us the, uh, the Capitol Dome was her playground at one time. Her father worked in the State House. Hmm.
And that's where he'd take her when she was a kid and she'd run all over the dome having a good time for herself. <laughs> yeah. Where did you play, Walter? Well, I played. I would never play. I always played a lot. The <laughs> <laughs> Denver Rio Grande Western, primarily standard gauge, kept its ancient narrow gauge lines running through the war. In Montana, vital wartime service was provided by this Anaconda Street Railway train on its way to the Anaconda Copper Company smelter in Opportunity. Smelter workers were paid for time traveling on the train. Wouldn't you just love to be paid for riding this CTA back to and from work? Mm. Anaconda Copper was a notorious exploiter of human resources. In Yakima, Washington, a local street car company owned by the Union Pacific Railroad developed a good freight business. Yakima is a nice town, except for Mount St. Helens below the top. Ah. During the war, Seattle had a municipally owned trolley bus system. Pollution free electric trolley buses still run there. Now we're in Council Crest in Portland, Oregon. College of Complex's regular attendee John Davis is hometown. The Portland Electric Power Company ran an arrow gauge street pass system supplemented with trolley buses. Also, it also operated standard gauge inter urban cars to Oregon City and Gresham. In California, Sacramento had wartime street guys. During World War II, Southern Pacific's peninsula service between San Francisco and San Jose was the only major railroad commuter operation west of Chicago. San Francisco is home to America's first and last cable car system. San Francisco created the world's first municipally owned transit system in 1912. The city's electric street cars and trolley buses were extremely busy during World War II. <coughs> San Francisco still operates both cable and electric streetcars, along with trolley buses. Across the bay in Oakland, T-System streetcars could be found working hard for the war effort. T-System operated trains to and from San Francisco via the lower level of the Bay Bridge. In the East Bay area, T-System trains fanned out to various communities, including Piedmont, pictured here. For the war effort, Key System operated ancient wooden elk cars from New York City on the U.S. War Department's then new Richmond, California Shipyard Railway. During the war, Los Angeles had a huge narrow gauge street car system. San Diego's wartime trolleys were kept very busy. World War II cities not previously mentioned that pollution had had pollution free electric street cars were Banger and Sanford Maine. Albany, New York, Wildwood, New Jersey, Newport News, and Roanoke, Virginia, Savannah, Georgia, Fort Wayne, and New Albany, Indiana, Little Rock, Arkansas, Salt Lake City, Utah, Lincoln, Nebraska, Akron, Ohio, Louisville, and Knoxville, Kentucky, La Crosse, Wisconsin, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Phoenix, Arizona. During the war, ODT allowed construction of 714 PCC cars in U.S. and Canadian cities. Over 100 U.S. cities had pollution-free electric street cars during World War II. The westernmost American trolley lines are on the Philippine island of Corregidor. The railway authorized by the U.S. Congress in 1907 was operated by the Army Quartermaster Corps. Its trolleys emulated mountain boats going up and down through rugged terrain. The Japanese captured Corregidor on May 4, 1942. When America retook the island on March 2, 1945, there was no trace left of the trolley lines except for one tunnel. During our whirlwind tour of America, what did we see? We saw millions and millions and millions of tons of freight move, and millions and millions and millions of rides given along with millions and millions and millions of barrels of gasoline and diesel oil saved, along with millions and millions and millions of tire miles saved. No small feat for the war effort. Can we accomplish such a feat today?
Most of what we've seen has been destroyed. Can there be salvation? After the war ended, America began to see its streets clogged with automobiles. Auto ownership greatly increased, and soon America was very oil dependent. Gridlock is now a serious problem in America's cities. In 1943, America had 27,250 street cars, 10,255 rapid transit cars, 3,501 trolley buses, and 47,100 gas and diesel transit buses for a total of 88,106 vehicles, of which 41,006 were electric powered. Since World War II, when the U.S. population was 140 million, we have lost most of our public transit service. Now with the population of 340.8 million, we need public transit, public transportation more than ever, and we'll need it more so in the future, because since 1990, immigration has brought 1 million new residents to America yearly. Prior to 1990, immigration was always under 400,000 yearly. What troubles me is anyone can start a war. If someone teams up with others and does start a war, this country could be very well cut off from much of the oil needed. Prior to 2009, when we had warmongers controlling the puppet president in the White House, this country made many more enemies than ever before. Many enemies would just love to take a whack at the USA. Boom! And if a large widespread land war started, to put it bluntly, we'd be screwed. Now in our automobile oil burning society, we have little public transportation left to fall, on, back, fall back on. Not only is oil dependency a problem, another problem is Rust Belt Americans are losing their skills. A few years ago, Dayton ordered new trolley bus components from the Skoda Company in the Czech Republic. Electric wiring work for the buses was done on the East Coast. Final assembly was done in Dayton, but only after machinists were brought in from Chicago. There were no qualified machinists left in Dayton. Is this not a wake-up call? Mm. Travel on our heavily subsidized airlines is becoming more and more difficult. Just remember what wise old Warren Buffett said, airlines don't make money. Much of the country grinds to a halt when inclement weather, a security issue, or a computer glitch grounds airplanes. Then airports jam up with people and passengers spend a day or two on airport cots until they can't catch a flight. Before the jet age, downtown Chicago had six railroad stations, Northwestern Station, Madison Canal, Chicago Union Station at Canal and Jackson, Grand Central Station at Harrison and Wells, LaSalle Street Station on Van Buren, Dearborn Street Station at Polk Street, and Central Station at Michigan and 11th Plain. Six stations with 18 different railroads that ran in all kinds of weather. In the U.S. during World War II, there were 233,670 route miles of railroad. Now the mileage is down to 99,250. Back then, railroads had 42,400 steam engines, 900 electric locomotives, and 970 diesel engines. Today's privately owned railroads have only 20,000 diesel engines. Amtrak has about 350 diesel engines and 75 electric locomotives. Freight cars numbered 1,684,000 during the war. They number only 560,000 today. Jobs on privately owned railroads have decreased from 1,026,000 to only 168,000. In general, railways in foreign countries once were nothing to brag about. After World War II, Europe and Asia rebuilt war damaged railways while America became automobile and oil dependent. Post war, America saw intercity passenger trains almost disappear when the railroads lost U.S. mail contracts. There are four mail cars in this Pennsylvania Railroad passenger train at Chicago's Englewood Union Station. Much high-speed railroad operation took a blow in 1952 when the Interstate Commerce Commission fed up with fatal passenger train wrecks, put a 79-mile-per-hour speed limit on all trains not under automatic train control. 
Starting in 1958, more and more commercial jet planes took to the skies, skewering most ground competition. In the year 2000, Amtrak began running the high-speed electric acela trains that are similar to the fine trains of Europe and Asia. Here are 25,000 volt AC wires on a cellar ready to leave Boston on a high-speed trip to Washington, D.C. On a long trip, it will only encounter three grade crossings. More than three million passengers ride the Acellas yearly. <coughs> this country very much needs more Acela-type trains. Similar trains travel between London and Paris in only two hours and 15 minutes. There are, there are more than 3,000 miles of truly high-speed train routes serving Euro a dozen European countries. Travel times have been cut tremendously. From Paris to Reims, cut from 1 hour 35 minutes to just 45 minutes. Paris to Frankfurt, six, 6 hours, cut to 4 hours. Madrid to Barcelona, 7 hours to 2 and a half hours. Helsinki to St. Petersburg, 5 and a half hours to 3 and a half hours. Brussels to Amsterdam, 3 hours to 1 and a half hours. And China, high-speed trains cut travel time from Beijing to Shanghai from 13 hours to only 5 hours. With narrow-minded obstructionist, with narrow-minded obstruct, <laughs> conservative obstructionist abound, can there be an American transportation salvation? This is Boston's historic Old South Meeting House, where on December 16, 1773, Sam Adams began the famous Boston Tea Party that ended up dumping British tea into Boston Harbor. Those tea parties were protesting taxes of a foreign power, but they never protested our Democratic Republic's taxes as the simplistic 21st century so-called Tea Party demagogues do. If the 18th century Boston Tea Parties came back to life, they would be puzzled by today's malcontents howling like mad dogs. <laughs> the founding fathers certainly were not against taxation. Quickly, they crushed Say's Rebellion and the Whiskey Insurrection. The original Boston Tea Parties would be astonished and very happy to see that Texas built a splendid bridge across the Charles River over which air-conditioned subway trains rolled. They'd be thrilled with our great highways, amazing air traffic control, social security, our wonderful parks, NASA, public health care, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, <laughs> sidewalks, fire departments, public schools and libraries for all. Why do the demagogues scream about big government? When we live in a very big country, the demagogues should move to tiny Luxembourg. Until the U.S. gets a written national transportation policy in place, we won't be seeing much in the form of high-speed rail. If America's busy at 6,000 miles of diesel railroad lines were electrified, one billion gallons of diesel oil would be saved yearly. U.S. railroads burn one billion gallons of diesel fuel annually. In recent decades, several heavy-duty electrified mine railroads have opened with AC voltages of 25,000 and 50,000. This is Ohio's Muskegon Electric that opened in 1968. I advocate having electrified high-speed rail from coast to coast, certainly not to compete with airlines, but to serve the many American towns completely devoid of public passenger transportation. In recent decades, several new U.S. commuter services have started up, such as this one in Maryland. Most intercity passenger trains, more intercity passenger trains would mean fewer airplanes in our crowded skies and congested airports. How long will it be before there's a tragic runway collision? Today, America's freight railroads are doing very well, and Warren Buffett is investing in them. American railroads reached the one trillion annual ton mile mark in the late 1990s. In the past, transit lines in foreign cities were nothing to brag about. The rebuilding of war damaged European and Asian cities after World War II brought about fine new transit operations that should be emulated in this country. Even though the U.S. doesn't have a written transportation policy that it's supposed to have, many new light rail systems have been built in the U.S. during the past three decades. 
holds pollution-free lanes and handicapped accessible, making them available to all. In the post-war era, only seven U.S. cities retained some trolley lines. They are Boston, pictured here, and Newark, New Jersey, with its expanded subway line, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which also operates trolley buses, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with substantially upgraded remaining lines, Shaker Heights, Ohio, connecting to Cleveland, and very hilly San Francisco. Also, New Orleans, where the St. Charles Avenue route is the world's oldest continuously operating streetcar line. It dates back to 1835. A new light rail operation came about in 1959 when Boston electrified an abandoned railroad line and tied it into the city's trolley subway system, expecting daily ridership at 11,000. More than 30,000 riders showed up. In 1964, CTA opened the Spokey Swift Rapid Transit service, expecting 1,100 daily riders. More than 3,000 showed up, and riding kept increasing. Since 1981, when this brand new light rail system opened in San Diego, California, more than 20 such operations have started up in the U.S. Others were San Jose, California, Sacramento, California's capital, Los Angeles, California, America's second largest city, Portland, Oregon, with a still expanding system, Salt Lake City, Utah's capital, and the Mile High capital city of Denver, Colorado, and Dallas, Texas, which also has new railroad commuter services, Minneapolis, with a planned extension to St. Paul. St. Louis, Missouri, connecting to nearby Illinois towns, and as Kenosha, Wisconsin, and also Buffalo, New York, and Baltimore, Maryland. New ones also opened at Honolulu, Hawaii, South Lake Union, Washington, Tacoma, Washington, Seattle, Washington, Phoenix, Arizona, Houston, Texas, Jersey City, New Jersey, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Norfolk, Virginia. Planned or under construction are lines for Tucson, Arizona, Fort Worth, Texas, Kansas City, Missouri, Detroit, Michigan, St. Paul, Minnesota, Cincinnati, Ohio, and Louisville, Kentucky. Dallas light rail is pictured there. Tourist type lines open in several cities. I say that electric trolley buses should not be overlooked when seeking ways to kick the oil hammer. Only five trolley bus systems exist in the U.S. today. World War II era cities not previously mentioned that had pollution-free electric trolley buses were Wilmington, Delaware, Knoxville, and Louisville, Kentucky, Flint, Michigan, Topeka, Kansas, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Youngstown, and Akron, Ohio, Duluth, Minnesota, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Honolulu, Hawaii. ODT allowed the building of 966 trolley buses for U.S. and Canadian cities during World War II. Post Three minutes? Yeah, about five more minutes. Five more minutes? Yes. Yeah. We're doing all right. Yeah. Uh, just remember that uh, Mike Flores took over two hours one night. Yeah. 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 You usually could do this in one hour, 15 minutes. It must be getting old. <laughs> Post war trolley bus system now. <coughs> Post war trolley bus system now all gone. Opened in Dallas, Birmingham, Los Angeles, Wilkes-Barre, Detroit, and Johnstown. In 1968, a new heavy rail system opened between Philadelphia and Linden Wall, New Jersey. This is America's first successful automated rapid transit line. Operators in most such lines are required to spend some time manually operating their trains, especially in inclement weather. In 1971, San Francisco's Bay Area Rapid Transit opened its first broad gauge 1,000 volt multi billion dollar high tech automated line. Just like the multi billion dollar Washington, D.C. Metro picture here, its aging high tech components are now failing at a rapid rate, causing much passenger dissatisfaction. Worse than that, there were several Washington crashes with one involving a runaway automated train 
a crash to another train of flaming results. In recent decades, heavy rail lines have opened in San Juan, Puerto Rico, Los Angeles, and Baltimore, pictured here. Also in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Miami. Only to be roundly criticized by President Reagan, the poster boy of today's Tea Party demagogues. Ronnie forgot that the poor and middle class need public transit. He also forgot to put his pants on. We don't have Ronnie anymore, but we do have demagogue uh, Grover Norquist, born Republicans who control our Congress have sworn allegiance to. So sad. A <coughs> Connor class Bill Wentz advocates for monorails. There's the one in Seattle that had both of its trains collide not long ago. I don't advocate for monorails, not for so-called people movers like the one at Morgantown, West Virginia, would remove if it had the funds to do so. Mm -hmm. I advocate installing electric transportation all over America. The way to do it is to take advantage of Wyoming's powder river basin coal fields with a 300 year supply of trillions of tons of low sulfur coal. Mm -hmm. Even the use of high sulfur Illinois coal would be okay when electric power is generated at coal gasification generating plants like the ones tentatively planned for Taylorville, Illinois, and Tampa, Florida. Two such plants are being built in Edwardsport, Indiana, and a very controversial one in Chicago's south side. In such plants, carbon monoxide and sulfur are removed, and a synthetic gas is produced for burning. No emissions have to be let into the atmosphere. Research now shows that emissions can be disposed of underground. Presently, solar and wind power electric <coughs> generation are still not fully developed. And I feel there are really way too many problems with nuclear generation. Dangerous problems. Just look to the Ukraine and Japan. Natural gas should be used for home cooking and heating, not for power generation. Now what about our dearly beloved Chicago Transit Authority? There's really no hope for it without a national transportation policy in place. The previous Chicago mayoral administration did little for mass transit. Hoping to privatize CTA officials call passengers customers, hoping that we forget that we, the public, own the CTA. Are you a customer when eating a meal in your own kitchen? The CTAL system could be a lot more efficient. For example, Boston Rapid Transit trains and streetcars have a passenger volume for a mile three times that of the CTAL. New York City subway volume is five times higher than the CTAs. One quick fix for CTA would be to provide more than the 6,000 automobile parking spaces it now has for its riders. Boston Transit has seven times as many 42,000 parking spaces, but planning for thousands more. And what about our daily beloved Metro? It's 146 locomotives burn 480,000 gallons of diesel oil per week. All of its lines should be electrified. One last word. And a classy coupe and a girl can be gay and a taxi cab all can be jolly. But the girl worth a while is the one who will smile when you're taking her home on the trolley. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Author, I'd like to thank you for your very uh, thoroughly researched presentation. And um, I didn't research, I made it up. Oh, okay. Thank you for your fantastic then, uh, presentation. Let's turn on the lights. They're, good. They're getting them on, Karina. Oh. How about we give it up for Walter again? Don't applaud just for money. That's what they said. Don't applaud just for money. So this is how this is going to work. Uh, Walter is going to keep the microphone right here. And then um, when you raise your hand, I'll call on you to ask a question. I will repeat the question because I have a very loud voice. And then uh, Walter will answer the question. So all those who have questions, please raise their hand. <coughs> How do we get off of dependency on federal funding? How do you get off on dependency of federal I heard funding? That. Okay. <laughs> we need more federal funding. More money goes out of Illinois than comes back. You know that, don't you, Bill? I don't. <laughs> we need more federal funding. We don't want to get off of it. Some people claim that cars and airplanes are private. 
are, are not are not subsidized. Can you respond to that? Sure they are. The licenses you pay for the automobiles, little politicians love all that money. Don't really pay for all the trouble they cause, especially asthma in this town. And uh, the airlines, they're notorious uh, eater of subsidies. Okay. Ernie, please. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> could you give us a quick primer on uh, the difference between AC and DC and overhead wires and, and the whatever you call it underneath and what the various advantages are? Why are they used in voltages and all this? Yeah, the cat and the catenary. It all depends on whatever view the management had. Some like the overhead wire, some like the third rail. And what's the relative advantages? I say third, overhead is probably better in the winter time. Third rail gets really covered with ice and the CDL trains in the winter. But uh, it, it really was up to management. There are advantages and disadvantages to both systems. Of course, the one dirty little story it was around that the railroads had all these different systems was so each railroad could keep the other one off of its tracks. Um, so that, of course, we don't know for sure. And why some were like 3,000 volts, I think you said. Less well, that depends. Like Westinghouse pushed uh, alternating current at a big high voltage, GE. Was all for direct current. What's, it, what's the advantage or disadvantage? AC, you can you have very few uh, substations. You can transmit alternating current for a long, long way. Well, like you go all around the city, you'll see substations the CTA has for direct current. Oh, so the CTA is on direct current. Yeah. Okay. Questions, please. Yes, Jeff. Uh, your presentation on the uh, change from uh, gasoline-driven engines to the electric trolley and uh, streetcar, the buses seem to, to use a lot of tires because of their, their heavy weight and so forth, mm -hmm. and yet the, the streetcars use a lot of steel in their wheels. Was, was there a balance there somewhere? I don't think so. If I, if steel wheels last for a long, long time. You have to make sure there's no cracks in them, otherwise you have a lot of trouble. Uh, another dirty little secret, the older a bus tire is, the less it costs to rent it. <laughs> Hell yeah, yeah. <laughs> bus drivers are screaming about that a few years ago. The older? Yeah, the older. Yeah, they, a lot of companies rent the tires. The older the tires are, the, the less they charge for rental. Uh, so the older they get, the company's out ahead, the buses are sliding all over the street. <laughs> Going back to Ernie's question, Ernie asked a question about AC versus DC and the different uh, different trains use different power outages. Is part of your proposal to have a standardized, we're all going to go AC or we're all going to yeah, have sure, the same sure. gauge? I, I would say, well, the standard in Europe and uh, is 25,000. That's what Amtrak is trying to change to. It's underfunded, of course, as long as the Republicans are in there. And uh, should be 25,000. Uh, both AC with uh, at, uh, 60 hertz or 60 cycles would be the best. And is that how that is in Germany and France and the yeah, they're UK? Just, and well, they're still converting, but that's the standard. But uh, the reason they stuck with DC too, uh, AC motors were very bulky and hard to control until recent times now with micro microprocessing. They can control the electric currents you know, scientifically. You can make a train stand on its head and go bow wow or anything. Well, years ago, DC uh, traction motors were the easiest to take care of. Well, alternating current motors were a big problem. So your, had to control. your proposal is that the United States, part of your proposal would be that the United States adopt the European standard of the yeah, 25. well, it's worldwide. It's not just European, Asian, African. And you would propose that we would adopt that as our standard? So sure, we're... why not? All right. Are they, are they AC or DC? They're all AC. They're AC, yeah. 25,000 volts. Yeah, because you can, you can send an ultimately current way out. And Bill over there likes DC more. <laughs> Bob Matter had a question. Um, yeah, well, uh, Cash, I got a so many questions, I don't know which, which one to start with first, but uh, let's start with uh, 
what responsibility do you think the transit unions have for, uh, for because, of, because of the uh, because of their you know, relentless uh, wage and benefit increases that service has been cut so bad people can no longer take transit. Like I know a lady who used to ride the bus with can't take it anymore because it, 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 the route ends too early. She has she has to walk too far uh, home, so she has she had to get a car and drive to work. And a lot of people, you know, it's the same not just for the CTA but like on the South Shore, what I, which I normally take as a two and a half, three hour headways, it quits running. Yeah, we get your point. Twelve forty five. They can't afford the, the people. What good is having all these fancy trains if you can't afford the people to operate? Well, you shouldn't ask me, a retired transit employee, why the transit employees are so wicked and overcharging. But the, the wage rate, I can't pick, pick it out. I'm not an economist. But I, usually most of the CTA contracts have been settled with an arbitrator. These are smart people, financiers, accountants, actuaries. I mean, uh, the lady. None of us can really afford to pay what it really takes to operate a bus, a streetcar, train, or even a rickshaw, perhaps. But uh, you either want to pay it and have it. But the only reason we have it is that, like Bill always says, the downtown businessmen want people brought back and forth. And that's it all in a nutshell. And blame the workers. What do you want? You want a uh, minimum wage and you want to get on the bus and no one's a drunk driving it. <laughs> We've had that a few times. Yeah. And cut the wages so they all quit. Like when they converted from streetcars to buses, they had a hell of a time. They all, every time you saw a bus or a streetcar in the late 40s and early 50s, it was a big sign. Wanted 1,000 men. They, when, when the work gets hard and there are a lot of jobs out there, you won't have anyone driving for you, except maybe drunks. <laughs> Questions. Right here. Tim. Tell us what you think about the most recent developments like the Eisenhower interstate system, containerized shipping, automatic traffic control, and of course uh, that newest thing out called uh, barcode shipping. Pretty good. Move goods all around the world. Push, push. In fact, in the east now, the railroads are developing large yards because you're going to see more and more container ships going through the enlarged Panama Canal. They're going to come from Asia and go right through the Panama Canal and up to the eastern United States. As a follow-up, have they been to North Platte, Nebraska recently? And the huge, the world's largest railroad yard yeah, there, right. the Union Pacific. Yeah. And don't you think, though, that with the uh, and tell us again what you think about the most recent expansion of the New York subway system that they're proposing right now beneath Union Station in New York City. The uh, Second Avenue subway? They're building a lot more than that. No, they're building, they're connecting the Long Island Railroad trains into Penn Station, the Grand Central Terminal for the first time, coming up through Queens and come down Manhattan. At the same time they're building the Second Avenue subway. Now get this, years ago $500 million was set aside for the 2nd Avenue subway in Manhattan. Somehow the $500 million just went into the system. Two separate sections are built, of course no trains can run through it. They're finally doing that after all these years. And the reason if you overrode the Lexington trains, the east side lines of the IRT in Manhattan, they're terribly overcrowded because when they ripped down the 3rd Avenue well, they were supposed to open up the 2nd Avenue subway. It's <laughs> still waiting for them. So, yeah, they really need that 2nd Avenue subway. Go ride the Lexington Avenue line. Questions? Yes, Bernie? Bernie yeah, probably well, knows the answer. Is, uh, technology that seems to have caught on in the rest of the world, but it didn't really catch on the world here. Why, uh, why is America behind the technology that's through the rest of the world? Why have we caught on with techno technological innovations that are in Europe and Asia? Because they don't care about riding around in trains. They like their automobiles. They love their automobiles. Then how is your idea going to work? 
if we love our automobiles. As long as the Republicans are in Congress, mm -hmm. it'll never work. And anything happens in the Senate unless they have 60 percent agree. No, nothing's ever going to work. Well, Rob, Maybe someday. Ralph Nader is elected president. How are you going to get me to give up my car and use the... Nobody the... asks you to give up your car, but when, when you get on... Yeah, I remember when you get on Western Avenue and shoot to the south side no time. It takes all day to do it now. I mean, some of the people want... Yes, sir. Adam, how are you? I find that her. That, uh, that was certainly an excellent, uh, certainly an excellent presentation. Um, I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, any chance that you get the contractors who did the 1939 subway who got the job done in two and a half years uh, for some of today's larger projects? And uh, probably not. They test everything. I mean, they don't do anything without being tested over and over. <laughs> My. Uh, I would like I, I would like to ask you. You, you had a number of slides uh, demonstrating uh, the benefits of intermodal. Um, our freight carriers wouldn't use railroads at all if they couldn't get their freight door to door from uh, origin to uh, transfer on, on the right. railroad, and then and then there's a uh, and, and then there's a high, then there's a highway trip at either end. But uh, you find. Park and ride tolerable when I think park and ride has an enormous subsidy to uh, has an enormous subsidy to motorists, and I just don't think it's affordable. Um, How can you justify using park and ride? Isn't that so? Go. I used to stand at 95th Street when I worked, was still working, and watch all the automobiles all jammed up. They're all going down the loop. All, and some of them are even reading, and writing. And, and, and it's, a, it's a joke. If they if they had well, first of all, they had better trains in the CTA, and they had a nice, convenient parking garage for them to go into. You know, that would get people from crawling down to the loop and back. And then, that's killing the kids in Chicago. Asthma rates are way high in these expressways. Half of the money spent on the interstate highway system is spent going through large cities, wrecking large cities. Ron, you had a question. Yes. Uh, how do you calculate the uh, pollution from the electrical plants that generate the electricity that runs these trolley lines and uh, uh, electrical? I mean, I mean, isn't that? What about the pollution that's caused by generating electric power? Yes. By well, now they figured out they don't have to. I mentioned that you don't have to send the emissions out into the atmosphere. They, maybe you can dispose of them underground. Like, and uh, if the Bush administration had to step in and stop this gasification, the coal gasification projects, maybe they'd be ahead. It's going to be very expensive to develop it. But we have lots of coal, and coal is less expensive than oil to generate electric power. That's, that's the way I see it. Yeah, uh, clearly uh, we're at the point where we're choking on our congestion, we're choking on our pollution, et cetera, et cetera, and it's becoming uh, almost a national security problem because we're so dependent on oil from uh, the Middle East, mm -hmm. is it practical at this point for uh, some kind of massive government program, <laughs> almost on the scale of the WPA, to rebuild uh, the transit systems uh, that were torn up after World War II uh, with modern Not improvements? the same way a lot of can we Can we afford to do that at this point? Probably. It would probably generate a lot of jobs and then you'd have a lot of people paying taxes that probably paid for itself. It always was in the past. The, the higher employment went, the lower the deficit it always was in this country. Until now, they're playing big games with us. You know, they don't give a damn about anything. <laughs> it's really gone to hell in a hand basket. <laughs> Some other way. But yeah, it, it would be a wonderful thing if they ever decided to. But is it too late at this point to do No, this? no. Like I've just pointed out, there are a whole lot of cities building light rail now. and. Uh, some heavy rail plan. 
and uh, more than 20 trolley lines have opened in the past 30 years in the United States. You know, where cities that had completely gotten rid of their trolleys years before. So they're pollution free, and you don't have, you have the power plant in one place, you, instead of a lot of little buses running all over, shooting out the oil, fumes all over. Tim Bolger. All right, tell us, uh, Thomas Friedman in his book, The World is Flat, advocated a dollar, an increase in the federal gas tax of a dollar fifty per gallon to do such things as public transport, transit, road infrastructure rebuilding, and to make the cost of driving a little bit higher, therefore making public transit agreeable to the driver. Tell me, do you like that principle or do you not? I would like it if they did it in areas where there is mass transit. You get some guy out in Wyoming and out in the sticks, he isn't going to pay a dollar an hour more. He's not going to do that so you can ride on a train or a bus here. You know, if they uh, had zones where they would charge the extra dollar for the people who benefit from it, yeah. But it would be worth it. Charles My Payton. opinion. Charles Paydock. Yeah, Walter Lois always maintained that she was on an L train. And, and the motorman read the newspaper. It was, <laughs> was late for work because one of your pals wanted to finish, wanted to finish reading the newspaper. That Roosevelt Road. And that, when she then moved off Halston Street, that there was a long-standing poker game <laughs> at the end of the line north of Belmont. That would now, be is there, way but seriously, is there any reason why, I don't know about the L's necessarily, but why is the CTA schedules incomprehensible, confusing, and almost never adhered to. Well, why, why can't the CTA skip, stick to a reliable schedule that's friendly? You have to ask the management that. They write the schedules. They're going to save. On it. Oh, the latest thing, uh, by the way, not too many know about it. Uh, they laid off, a, there's a thousand bus drivers still laid off. And uh, what they did. Part time is only supposed to work, I think, 32 hours a week. And now, Local 241 of the Amalgamated Transit Union now has the CTA in arbitration. The union figured <coughs> out that they have used part timers illegally for 318,000 hours of work. So, <laughs> so you, you're dealing with a real foxy outfit, so don't expect anything. If they can kill a job or kill uh, service. Is there, uh, can you name a uh, country with an efficient mass transportation system that is in private hands rather than public? Japan is both public and private over there. Of course, there are different kind of people in Japan. They make everything work for some reason. In China, you better do what they're told to do. Although they're not really, they have an awful few bad crashes. In fact, one New bridge on a high speed line collapsed luckily before they started the service <laughs> a couple of months ago. Uh, yeah, most of Europe uh, the trains run really well. In the city trains. But in, in private well. hands. As a Very little of it left. Now, England went to privatization. Of course, you, what really is behind that is union busting. And then the politicians love that, the kickbacks, because you give a contract to someone, they're going to donate to you. But uh, England now has the highest rail fares in all of Europe, thanks to the privatization. They have a split. They have one private op one private operator for operating the trains, another one for taking the tracks up and fixing them, another for repairing the cars, and all three of them don't get along and have gone to hell. So uh, I don't know why they yell about privatization when it didn't work. Yeah. It went public. <laughs> Do you endorse the idea of having a high-speed rail from Un um, from Grand Central Station in New York to Union Station in Chicago? Yeah, I do, but you're never going to see it. It costs too much to build it. 
first of all, uh, just think of the land you'd have to buy and when you'd have to go over the present lines. The airlines aren't going to let you do it, first of all. And uh, I would like high-speed rail, as I said, from coast to coast, not to race airplanes. But uh, the uh, you got all these towns that have no transportation at all. And a nice high-speed train, you get on in one town and zip to the next town and zip over. That's what I like to see happen. Are there any current plans between Chicago and St. Louis or Chicago oh, yeah. and Detroit? Sure, it's good. Yeah, well, they have the one partially operating to Detroit, although a whole bunch of the track had to be uh, uh, slowed down. Okay. Hello there. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of plans. California is the place where that's happening. All up and down the state, they've got the high speed rail. And of course, California is broke. But the more more they do on it, the uh, the more workers that are working on it are going to be paying taxes. It's going to help the economy in the long run. And uh, one thing about high speed trains, uh, like it's ridiculous to go fly an airplane from Boston to New York. Yeah. Look at all the time you spend getting searched at the airport. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about my first airplane ride. Can I do that? Yes. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. I couldn't do it today. My first airplane ride was June 15th, 1949. And I lived on Cottage Grove Avenue and I was flying back to Boston to stay at my grandmother's for the summer. We left the, house, the apartment on Cottage Grove, went over to Midway, and probably an hour before the plane left, went right out of the airport was like a bus depot. We just walked right in, got on the plane. The flight was uh, four hours long. It landed at an old piston engine planes. Landed at Buffalo. Landed at Cleveland and Buffalo, and then in Boston. From the time I left my our place on Cottage Grove Avenue until I got to my grandparents in Boston. It was uh, no longer than six hours we did that. You could not do that today. The plane will get you there from Chicago to Boston in one hour. You're going to spend all day at the damn airport getting searched and then provide the plane is running the airport. All right. Uh, any more questions? Uh, all right. Tim, you had your hand up for a long time. Tell us what you think about the Atchison, Topeka, and the Shinkansen. <laughs> That's cute. I don't know where that is. That's going to be one hell of a bridge they're going to build <laughs> across the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Bob Matter. Yeah, well, um, how does bus break down? Let's say on, on long distance passenger rail, uh, when you buy your ticket, let's say it costs uh, $400 for your train ticket, how does that break down? What percent of that is for like energy? What percent is for the Equipment and maintenance and what percentages for the labor? No, I can't re recite the formula now. You have all kinds. First, the terminal charges are thrown in, what it costs to switch the train together and all the rest, and get it ready. That, that counts as part of the fare. And then, of course, everything, all passenger services subsidized these days. There wouldn't be one of it all. So uh, I guess you can call them up and they'll tell you. Uh, Bill, I well, what do you think of bus rapid transit? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It works in Europe. Uh, WTTW was pushing it a uh, month or so ago, showing the great system in Mexico City. Mexico City doesn't have ice dogs like we have mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So as far as, if they're going to do anything, they ought to think about light rail. And Western Avenue would be a good street for us. Uh, I mean, you, you can talk about bus rapid transit all you want. It's still a bus. It's still going to slide all over the place. It's a lot easier to plow a, a rail line and keep a bus line open. Isn't that right? <laughs> Any more questions? Well, then I guess we're about ready yeah, now. Yeah, she should answer. She went to Boston That's University. Boston. Like she's smarter than us. Commonwealth Avenue had the green, too, green right? line. Yeah. What do you think I, yeah, about the, the T? Yeah, I, I kept calling it the T when I was in Chicago. I had to switch my letters from T to L. <laughs> Why is Boston so screwy with their street signs? 
<laughs> uh, it's an historic uh, Boston. Oh, you're talking about the year 1630. They didn't have a regular grid. So uh, we're ready now to start our rebuttal ready period. Now. Uh, thank you again, Walter. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't applaud just for money. <laughs> Walter wants you to know that he'll take tips. Um, <laughs> Prom, are you keeping track of time? Oh, I can. Or uh, unless you want to show me how to do it. How many people have a rebuttal? Three. I mean, I four, well, five. Minutes. I'm gonna give it five five minutes a person. Yeah. Right. Five minutes probably be good. <laughs> With uh, you having the final rebuttal. Well, I don't really want them to have five minutes of rebuttal. Five minutes of agreement. Five minutes worship session. <laughs> okay, let's uh, get started here. Five minutes each. And we all know how this um, rebuttal system works. Uh, people move along this train of chairs, and then when it's their turn, they scoot up one chair, and the person takes the mic. All right. Uh, start time for Jack Meyer. Joe Meyer. Joe. Mostly a few anecdotes, uh, but I must say that, Walter, I really appreciated your your presentation. It was very informative, very illuminating, and uh, I, I appreciate your mental ag agility in putting it all together. Very nice. Well, thank you. You're going to make me blush? I hope so. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a few anecdotes, uh, some of which you brought up, some didn't. Um, the Rock Island Railroad opposed the uh, construction of the red line beyond 95th Street mm -hmm. because the Rock Island at that time was not Metro, it was Rock Island, and they served the south suburbs and the red line would have served them too. In fact, the uh, highway, I-57, uh, was built with uh, space in between the north and southbound lanes so that they could put tracks out there yeah. all the way to 147th Street. Didn't work. Um, might still someday. They don't have to. Yeah, they have to. Well, what they want to do now is uh, run the red line out to 120, 135th Street by tearing down all the houses along State Street out there. Yeah. Pretty really smart. Yeah. Um, a, a little anecdote. Uh, um, Marge and I uh, travel on an overnight train from uh, Luxembourg. Uh, to uh, Munich, and uh, it, it was an adventurous ride, even at night. <clears throat> uh, when we got into the Munich train station at 7 o'clock in the morning, it's rush hour in, uh, in Germany at that time, uh, we got our luggage and we got off the, the train, and we're standing in a line. We have no idea why the line is there. So I leave the luggage at Mars there, and I go up to the head of the uh, line, and at every track, there are 17 tracks in the station there. At every, the head of every track, there's a cart with beer cellars. <laughs> and all of the people on the train, they would just stand in line, get their stein of beer. This is 11% alcohol, by the way, isn't it? <laughs> and they'd, they'd bring it up, and then they'd set the stein over there where someone would wash it, and they'd go on to work. Some of the people would get two steins of beer and walk to the back of the line <laughs> and drink that on their way, get two more, and then go to work. <laughs> uh, in, in our travels uh, in, in Europe also, we, we did notice that there was this uh, gauge problem between France and Spain because they, the French or the Spanish, or maybe both, didn't want the uh, the, the trains of one country to go into the other, which would facilitate invasion. So the way it what works, you, you take the French train to the border with France, they lift up the train, pull out the trucks, put in the new Spanish different gauge, lower the, the, uh, the train, the passenger train again, and then you go on. Marvelous. It still takes um, less time to transfer into a bus in Chicago. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Illinois Central Railroad uh, wanted to increase its dividends uh, to its uh, shareholders, which would mean higher uh, bonuses to the management. So they sold, they, they had a, a, a two main lines running from Chicago all the way to New Orleans. They, they tore up and sold one of those main lines and uh, got a good price for it. And then after that, they sold the entire railroad to the Canadian National Railroad. Mm -hmm. It's land grant line. Um, I guess that's all I've got to say. Walter, uh, again, thank you for a fantastic program. I found it electrifying. Uh, <laughs> I knew you'd get that in. Oh. I knew you'd get something in. Uh, some questions were brought up about direct current versus alternating current and third rail versus overhead wire or in the industry as it's called cat bearing. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. DC technology is a much older technology than AC. <coughs> also the uh, series mount DC motors, these the real old style motors, very efficient. Uh, I think like a century ago they were getting 90% efficiency out of these things. Much more efficient than <coughs> pardon me, AC. Another advantage to low voltage DC, low voltage being defined as below a thousand volts, is that the motors themselves, the traction motors, generally operate in the several hundred volts, sometimes up to a thousand volts, uh, as their current source. So you can run current essentially right from the third rail into the traction motor through uh, control equipment. You don't have to convert it to DC to then use it uh, for the traction motors. Okay, you might remember from high school physics, power is the product of voltage and current. If you have low voltage, you need high current to get the same amount of power and vice versa. DC systems are inherently low voltage systems typically in the range of about 600 volts. You need a hell of a lot of current to power a train. You take an 8 car CTA train, you're talking several thousand amps. Now, 600 volts can kill you, but it doesn't take a heck of a lot to insulate yourself from it. If you're careful, you can walk about uh, the tracks and you probably aren't going to get injured. AC, on the other hand, uh, is efficient because you can uh, use very high voltages with AC, but it's dangerous as hell. It must be overhead wire. If you're talking AC, you're talking high voltage, you're also talking overhead wire. Uh, and it's not, uh, if you have overhead wire there, it's not that easy to necessarily convert from DC to AC. You have the Metroelectric system. I was a presentation a number of years ago and even if they wanted to convert that to high voltage AC, 25,000 volts would arc over. The clearances just aren't there to allow for uh, high voltage AC, even though it would be much more efficient in terms of uh, transmission. Who told you that? John Allen, PhD in transportation. Yeah. He Don't said it can't it. be done. Not on that system. You couldn't go to uh, the There was, either. you know, it was. When they started putting the double-decker cars on, I think it was, around 79th, no, it was around 79th Street, they had to reduce speed because the cars would bounce and uh, there was arcing between the overhead wire on the roof of one of the cars. You try putting AC in there, for sure that's going to happen. Okay, uh, third rail can be used in a confined space such as the subway tunnel where you may not have room for overhead wire, but the room for the third rail is there. Many of the older AC systems would tra uh, transmit uh, high voltage AC and the locomotive or the multiple unit equipment before it got to uh, the traction motors the AC would be uh, transformed to low voltage DC for use in the traction motors that was the technology for many many years these great big GG1's had huge transformers weighing about 30 tons each to do is they'd be transformed uh, to low voltage AC and then rectified into direct current for use in the traction motors. Newer technologies, AC motors. well they do use AC motors, right? the newer technologies, newer technologies 
use variable frequency, variable voltage AC motors, which are lightweight and very easy to control. The motors are controlled not only with the voltage, but with the frequency. And this, the controls and the inversion is all done electronically. These are Micro high processing. Pardon? Microprocessing. Microprocessing, correct. It's all done electronically and very efficiently at that. And also, the uh, newer equipment, the CTA 5000s, uh, have this uh, feature called regenerative braking. And what that is, uh, it used to be before the 5000 series rapid transit cars, the motor then applied the brake and it would convert the traction motors into generators pass current into resistors, which would put uh, a load on the generators and effect braking on the train. Now, the traction motors are again converted into generators. Current is put into the inverter, where it's fed back into the power system at a slightly higher voltage than line voltage, which again puts a load on the motors. And it, it's called regenerative braking. It supplies current back to the system. And I guess my time's up. Okay. Oh, that's oh, God. One last thing. Joey, a friend of mine, uh, Walter knows him, part-time CT for a number of years. He Ooh. works at Joey. Joey who? General Bo's friend. Worked 79 hours last week. Yeah. Part-time. Yeah. Part-time. Yeah. Oh. sure to help. Yeah, yeah. A thousand bus drivers. <laughs> Walter, you know, one thing that's going to bring rapid transit back is when the cost of driving in these urban areas rises to an extent to where it's no longer practicable. We have seen in places like Singapore and in London things called congestion pricing. Your rich can go into town and they don't care about cost. They can get to their places on time in a private car. But at the same time, because of the number of people needing to go into town, they've extensively upgraded their public transit infrastructure. At the same time, the reason Los Angeles is building its subway structures again is the cost of driving and time wasted in a car on the Los Angeles freeways has been increased way too much. Even in some of these suburban areas, there's trends towards walkable communities. We're rediscovering uh, the joys of city life. And I myself, in having to commute from Algonquin to Franklin Park every day, sometimes wish, I wish there was a way to get there by public transit. Well, there is, it's called the train, but it would take me about two hours on the train instead of the 45 minutes it would. Now, if I was to do it practically, I'd still have to take a 20 minute drive to Elgin, pick up the Elgin train from Elgin to Franklin Park, but I will tell you one thing. It might make sense in the reverse way because the train gets there at 520, 5610 in Elgin, and I'd still be home about the same time as I would be have I just driven these marvelous expressway systems with notoriously known for their backups and jam ups. For me, I think what's ultimately going to determine whether we go back to public transit is when the cost of gasoline rises to such an extent that it'll make driving somewhat costly to do. And even in these rural communities where people and farmers are, are around and, and they're, they're using their cars and their trucks, uh, it'll, it'll get to a point where people need cities and they need reliable public transit. And I do believe that our country will get to such an extent, it might take 100 years or more, but yeah. I think the train is coming back. And as we know, for freight usage, uh, UPS, for example, uh, runs trains all the time out of their, uh, I think, not their Franklin Park, but their, uh, they have a big, large container. Hodgkins. Hodgkins Park. Mm -hmm. And then they run them right down into, right across the country. And then I know they're serviced in, in, in North Platte, Nebraska. Entire freight trains are UPS ground packages. And they still get to their destinations within two, three, four, five days all over the country. And it's amazing the amount of infrastructure that you can do and see how this freight runs. One of the best things I've ever seen was the invention of the container for container sh containerized shipping. I know it's cheaper to ship stuff to China and on a ship than over here, but without trade, I don't think we would see the amount of prosperity that we're doing around the world today, myself. And 
the only thing that's really holding us back now is the restrictions on the movement of people. In the next hundred years, if there's one thing you're going to want to realize is that the whole age of the world is aging. You're seeing a demographic shift, not in just the United States, but all over the world with an aging demographic. And, and along with it is going to mean a lot more people, you know, wanting to use things like public transit or other modes of transportation besides driving. And even in China today, which is probably the biggest and fastest builder of roads and interstate highway systems, is also building light rail and is also building much needed public transportation infrastructure. But what is really the driving force behind China's growth? It's like it or not capitalism. <laughs> and it's like it or not trade. Now to you guys who think that these uh, corporations and these WTO and all this stuff doesn't work, well, I tend to differ. I, can't, I just simply state to you that everybody was poor 300 years ago and look what the average man does now, at least in our country. They have cell phones and TVs and can even afford to get a TV camera like I do. So If he has a job. Well, you know, even if you don't have a job, there's a lot of government don't forget programs and subsidies. Now, the thing is, Walter, if you have a government infrastructure, you also have to pay the rent to maintain it. Mm -hmm. I am not one of these guys who says decrease taxes, give the rich what they're, what, get, you know, soak the rich. People need to pay their fair share. Thank you. I think Walter said five million people take a train a day in New York City, and I believe about a million take a train. More than five million a day, no. And almost a million take a train anywhere in Chicago a day. So that's not, that's not too bad. If you figure there's only nine million people in this town. So I don't think the train went away. Anyway, this is a good little platform for uh, promoting the New York Chicago bullet train. Please break up, pick up your postcard at the table. Check out the website. We're on Facebook too. Anyway, um, Walter, it was interesting that you mentioned Buddy, Buddy Holly died on a plane. Yeah. How many times do you ever hear of a famous person that died on a train? Never. <laughs> they die in helicopters, planes, cars, motorcycles. You never hear of a train passenger dying. But anyway. The reason uh, Walter was uh, promoting trains so much tonight was that 75% of our oil use is perishable oil. You know, I don't mind oil to make this plastic part, that plastic part, chemicals, everything else, because it has a longer life. But oil, for transportation purposes, guess what? It's gone forever. Anyway, um... So we should all raise dinosaurs? I don't know. I, I, I personally think that some technology is going to come along eventually for batteries and cars. It's, it's, there's too many people working on it, too many capitalists. Where's Tim? Anyway, uh, as soon as somebody figures out some good battery technology for personal vehicles, I think uh, oil might go away big time. Anyway, here's some bullet train pictures. Yeah, they're building them all over the world. There's a pretty picture there, bullet trains, bullet trains in the snow. Yep, yep, they're doing it everywhere. So please contact your politicians and media in Chicago and have them promote the New York Chicago bullet train. Oh, by the way, almost a trillion dollars of our economy goes to oil every year. And personally, one last anecdote or two. Uh, of the 5,000 commercial flights between New York and Chicago, they burn about 5,000 gallons each of gas daily. 5,000 commercial flights a day in cities between New York and Chicago burn between 2,000 and 5,000 gallons of gas daily. Yeah, and, uh, you know, 737, 757, name your, name your brand. Yeah, it's, they, and, and guess what? No pollution controls on planes. No way. Can't do it. Um, what else? Buddy Holly. Oh, and I think that really the reason we're so worried about Iran. I was an interesting article in The Onion 
couple months ago. <laughs> it said, Iran is worried about America building its 8,500th nuclear bomb. <laughs> so I really think we're worried about Iran building one because of oil. <laughs> so uh, that's about all I got to say. Go get your New York Chicago bullet train. Question for the rebutter. Why do you have that piece of pornographic literature on your head? They won. <laughs> yeah, yeah, North Side now. North of Madison Street. I'm a Wrigley Field fan. I'm a Wait, you're why you wearing the hat? Exactly. There's a big difference between a Wrigley Field fan and the Cubs. One's history and one's the pro. Yeah. I thought he might have been. The only thing in common is the red line, right? What's that? The only thing they have in common is the red line. <laughs> yes. So much for electric rail. <laughs> Bring the hooligans together efficiently. Get your new great show, Walter. Great show. And we got a little more into the politics and economics of the time, which is good. How many slides did you say you have? I think there was 300. No, no, I've been not not tonight. I mean, period. Oh, I today. don't know. My friends and I we're, we're addicts. I don't know. I have thousands. Of I know. Uh, I thought some of you said twelve thousand once or something. Or 15, wow. that I don't know. I have twelve thousand. I know I have one thousand about fifteen hundred pictures of Chicago streetcars. Okay. <laughs> And That's elevator just, trains and the railroads all over. All right. Anyway, I, I'm going to throw my uh, two cents into this New York Chicago <laughs> thing. Statistics that I saw a couple of years ago, they may have changed. Uh, Ch Chicago Public Transit, and I think this includes Metro, 1.5 million passengers a day. New York City, uh, 7.5 million. So they're they're quite a bit bigger that. How way. much bigger and in population is New York than Chicago? Uh, triple, probably yeah. metropolitan area triple. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a way to have higher usage. Well, they have it. That's right. The There's volume. a higher percentage of that population that uses rapid transit yeah. right. than here. Okay. Five times higher than. Well, I'm talking about elevated lines. Yeah. Well, now that New York as is far five as times more, higher than Chicago's. In terms of their their of the volume, use okay, yeah, per mile, yeah. And Boston's is three times higher than Chicago's. Really, that I didn't. And know. which is very small town in comparatively. It's and smaller. And the Boston streetcars carry three times as many as Chicago's. Boston, well. Boston's a little more dense. Yeah. Well, what what I did, I want to just uh, amplify Tim's point. I think that uh, uh, as a point of economics, the way to make people people use trains and other rapid transit is when uh, automobiles become ex as expensive as they should be. Uh, if we raise the, the tax on gasoline, uh, you know, I've stood up here and said I think we should have a $10 a gallon tax on gasoline and I almost got lynched a couple times, but that's, you know, if we go to 10 and if that cuts the usage in half, fine, then that's not so bad. If it doesn't, then make it $15 a gallon, you know until it gets to the point where people actually either start uh, uh, sharing rides, you know, uh, uh, what's the term I want to use uh, for commuting, and or carpooling. carpooling, yeah, there's one, or van pooling, or various other methods to, uh, to reduce, uh, and more efficient cars, and yes, the electric car will be coming, uh, you know, become a reality, at least for uh, commuting within probably the next five or ten years. Uh, for a lot of people, but that is the, the basic way to do it, is, is to use economics. Also, uh, I think cities should do some form of congestion pricing, and we pay, what, uh, 150 or something for a city sticker now, and then our plates and such. That should go way up. That should go way up, in my opinion. 30 and bucks for your 65. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's gone up a little bit, but it hasn't gone up enough. And uh, I would think that such uh, stickers could give uh, limited versus unlimited use. In other words, you pay more. If you want to use all the roads 24 hours a day, you pay much more. If you're willing to you just use the, the roads in your neighborhood during the non-rush hour, during the rush hours, then you pay less. Something along those lines. Oh, off peak. Uh, yeah, off peak. Yeah, but but have you know various various versions of it that people uh, that people could use. And other ways of, of encouraging uh, carpooling, 
such as a computer system where people can link up and things like that. I think there may be versions of that already out there, but it could be improved. All right, thank you. Public transit. We'll be confused and terrible. I want to thank Walter for a very excellent presentation. That's number one. He blushed on again. Yeah, right. <laughs> number two, some comments were made earlier about how employees somehow record, increase the costs of public transit. I would argue that in fact it's as much a function of business as anything else. Uh, how often have we seen instances such as, for example, when the, what became the Susquehanna Corporation closed down the North Shoreline? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or, for example, when Harry Truman was a U.S. Senator from Missouri, in the 30s, and he was also serving at that time as the vice chair of the Senate Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee. And under his vice chairmanship, the, that committee conducted a series of investigations into skullduggery in the railroad industry. Chairman Burton Wheeler was busy with other matters, so Senator Truman chaired the hearings, and he made his report to the Senate, in which he stood up and said, that he pointed out that Jesse James and his gang had to get up early and risk their lives in order to rob the Rock Island Railroad of $3,000. And he went on to add, Senators can see what pikers Mr. James and his gang were alongside of some real artists. <laughs> so, I don't know that union people deserve all, most, or even any of the blame for the high costs of uh, any high cost of operating railroads and other public transit. Um, it was pointed out earlier by Joe that uh, there was opposition from the Rock Island to extending the CTA's Red Line South. That uh, didn't happen only in that part of the city. When the West Northwest or Blue Line was completed, completed originally out to Jefferson Park, Chicago Northwestern under, uh, a, or rather its president, Larry Cromo, intervened to do his best to get it stopped from being extended out to O'Hare since the railroad already served the northwest suburbs and he wasn't interested in competition from the L. He won the North Shore right away. Yes, Mr. Thank you, Ed. Mr. Cromwell was beaten back, of course, as we know, and the L was eventually built out to O'Hare. Well, ben Heineman and Claude Fitzpatrick, too. Yes, but Cromwell was the big spokesman who was on the news at the yeah. time. Yeah, president. Finally, Walter tell us, uh, talked about his first airplane trip, and while I don't remember my very first one, I will share this one with you. Uh, I was flying home from Washington, D.C. in the fall of 1959 when I was five, almost six, on a carrier that doesn't exist anymore, Capital Airlines, mm. and on, an, uh, on a turbo prop of Vickers Viscount. Wow. Yes, indeed. And that, in those days, turboprops weren't for weren't little bitty planes for commuter airlines. No, no. The Viscount, which was the first one, first turboprop ever designed, and its American competitor, the Lockheed Electra, were for the time full-size airliners with four engines. And I was flying home with my parents and my brothers from visiting Washington, D.C., where my grandparents lived. And my father, who could arrange just about anything, managed to arrange something at that time that was perfectly legal today it would not be. Namely, I was summoned up to the cockpit and put on the captain's lap and got to watch while the first officer flew the plane. Something that the FAA today would yes. not permit uh, due to all the skyjackings that no one now is permitted in the cockpit with the flight crew. Thank you. Any no. <laughs> okay, well, Walter, yeah, thanks for a really excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. It's such a great, it is a, a great collection and uh, uh, everything, uh, and it really, really is uh, quite a historical perspective on things. Uh, however, when it comes to funding transit, I, I, I still think that, uh, you know, we have to examine Henry George's proposal, and that is, uh, you know, finding a way to fund this 
And well, you know, well, um, uh, this uh, guy uh, Johnson from Cleveland. Don't take that. What was his see. name? Uh, Johnson from Cleveland, the mayor. Tom oh. Johnson. Right. Yeah. Tom Johnson. Ta Tom Johnson. Uh, you know, they they funded transit through uh, a land value tax, and uh, the the thing is. Uh, when you put a transit line somewhere, it makes the value of the surrounding property go up. And uh, r right now there's a guy building uh, some new uh, rail line in, in London, and uh, you know every, uh, every so many feet per day uh, that they build, you know, uh, you know his property holdings, he, he bought all this property first, then he decided, you know, then he put the rail line through, but he's making like he make this property value goes up like ten thousand dollars a day or something. Uh, every, every time they they dig, you know, ten feet or something. Uh, so the landowners, as Adam Smith said in Wealth of Nations, uh, and has been reiterated by for, by many other kind of staff words, that it's the landowners that are the beneficiaries of all uh, you know improvements uh, you know in society and. Uh, we need to get that that land back. We know that if you uh, if you open up a transit stop in front of some apartment building, that land loan lord that owns that apartment building can now raise the rents, and people will pay them because it's closer to the train. You know, it's more convenient. Uh, so we need to capture that that money back. Is that something the landlord had nothing to do with? Uh, you know, and plus the value of his building is higher, so he can borrow more against it and when he sells it he can get more for it so uh, why not you know fund uh, you know transit through a land tax however that does not give carte blanche the unions to uh, <laughs> keep up this you know this relentless push for higher higher wages and <laughs> pension benefits now pension benefits are taking Illinois to bankruptcy just like California and the public, I don't think they would mind paying land value taxes so much, but they re will resist it when they see that, you know, these, these uh, CTA employees, the average one, which, by the way, makes 75000 a year just in pay. That's disgraceful. Uh, it should be $100,000. Uh, you know, that, so that, you know, here's what we have to do. You know, if we're going to get into, like, some free market stuff here, we need to have a free market so in labor and not... A, a coercive, uh, you know, union that's that have, some arbitrator can come in from the federal government and make the CTA pay these guys, you know, what what they demand. And of course, politicians want to come in because they want their votes. And that's the that's why public unions are really so pernicious. It should be, uh, well, I mean, you can have a, a union. That's not a problem. The problem is the uh, this forcing uh, of the of the employer, in this case, the CTA. To have to accept these these outrageous uh, wages and uh, benefit demands, uh, but you know certainly yeah people should be able to join a you know combination or a union if they want to, and uh, but the thing is though that the employer should not have to buckle down you know buckle into them. Oh no. And so what we should have is you know a free market. I don't think people would object you know if there was a free market. I work as a free market employee. I mean, I, my, uh, my boss, uh, you know, gave me a, a, an offer. I mean, I, I told him what I wanted. He gave me an offer, and then we negotiated, and, uh, you know, we came up with, with an amount, and then I worked hard and got some raises, and, uh, and that's, that's how it works. And I don't think people would mind that so much, because that's how, that's how a lot of other people, uh, you know, do too. You know, they, it's a free market. <laughs> but but that's not so uh, you know with, with, with these with these union guys. Um, now, long passenger rail and everything these long distance things, uh, because of the fact that right now the situation the country's in is not the time to do it because of I've talked this before talked about this before it's high capital turnover. This is not the time to have high capital turnover. Uh, I mean low capital turnover projects like a, like a transit project or a bridge. That ties up money for too long. That money would be better spent. We'd get more jobs using it for things like real bills. They call real bills loans. In other words, short-term business loans for, for businesses. 
and where that money will turn over faster. What money? That it will take 30 years. The, any, the money, money that's They're used, sitting on trillions uh, of dollars in Wall Street right now. Well, that's Wall Street, but that's not, that's not, you know, anybody's one. That's oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I would like to use the remaining two minutes of my five minutes still to make a few more uh, comments here. First of all, on the raising of gasoline taxes in order to discourage driving. Raising gasoline taxes is an event that occurs now. And uh, today you're filling your tank, and while you're filling it, the price goes up. Good. I've seen that happen. Yes, right. no. But infrastructure, the development of public transportation may take five or ten years. So what happens to the people who can't afford the gasoline but now have no other public transportation facilities available to them? It's very difficult. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, Walter mentioned the interstate highway system. Uh, the original purpose of the interstate highway system was not to facilitate truck transport between the cities or regions. It was to be able to move army troops right. from one region to another. And that's why the uh, exits are numbered, uh, so that the, the guy sitting at the head of the troop movement can just count the number of exits and they'll know where to get off, even if the uh, revolutionists or the, uh, the others eliminate the signs. And a little anecdote, I mentioned before margin uh, we we uh, took an overnight train from Luxembourg to uh, um, Munich, but on the train at night it uh, was crowded. We were sitting in a little compartment, and Marge was peeling an apple. And uh, the train stopped, and people got on, and a, a couple got on on, on our our little compartment there, and uh, Marge realizing that if the train started up. It's, and she's got the knife out here that the woman could possibly injure herself. She, she put the knife back here uh, by her side. The train started up, the woman fell, and he, she fell right on the knife, mm -hmm. cutting her thumb. And then in German, I speak German, she, she told her husband, that woman stabbed me. <laughs> ah. <laughs> uh. Well, one of the reasons that the Vietnam War was such a mess is that the U.S. military was basically fighting, refighting World War II. They thought, uh, you know, typically, it's, uh, the military fights the last war, and that's kind of what we got tonight. Much as I'd like to turn back the clock, I mean, that, you, that's basically what you were doing. You want to turn back the clock to the World War II transportation system. So I don't like what's happened in the transportation since World War II, but we can't go back there. Now, a few minor corrections. I was not born in Indiana. Oh. 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 I was not born yes. in Indiana. Good news for Governor. Well, anyway, uh, where was the circus? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, the monorail that I advocate is not the Elway monorail like they got in, in Seattle. The Elway monorail uses a concrete, uh, a heavy concrete beam with a rubber tired vehicle on top of the beam. I'm advocating a suspended monorail with a vehicle underneath the beam propelled and suspended by linear induction motors, which is just a glorified electromagnet. What's incomprehensible about this system is that it uh, these electromagnets exert magnetic forces in two directions, vertically and horizontally. But otherwise, they're basically the same thing that you have in a can opener or a fan or other small appliance. That's a rotor induction motor. And we can do a lot more for a lot less with this type of a system than we can with all these light rail and 
heavy rail and bus rapid transit and a few other things. And uh, you think you should know that this bus rapid, you mean you talk about, you know, hear about the, the complaints about these, this, real, uh, this investment, infrastructure investment trust. Well, that's basically because the federal money is running out. We don't have to argue whether it's good or bad. It's running out. We don't have to argue about oil because oil is running out too. Or at least a foreign oil. Now they're saying they're finding all kind of oil in North Dakota. I don't know how true that is, but you know maybe we won't have. But even if we do find oil in North Dakota, I think we ought to go to a different system. You mentioned the uh, Norfolk and Western. It was building steam engines up until 1952. Well, I think that's worth a little exploration in, in its own right because they were building they were building a locomotive. They could handle fast freights much more economically than diesels do now. So, I don't know, you know, all this expertise. I mean, I didn't even look at the. Uh, the, the video myself. I mean, I kind of knew what, they, what, 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 was, what was coming. A couple things I kind of wish I saw. But uh, there's a few other things that could be clarified about the difference between AC and DC. This, this, uh, a linear induction motor would not work with DC. You couldn't do it. Because uh, Direct current cannot induce eddy currents in a nearby conductor, which is the essence of the linear induction motor, or the rotor induction motor for that matter. And uh, there's some confusion about the, I don't know if you make that big a point out of it, but about whether Rotor, DC or AC motors are more efficient. I mean, there's some difference there, but the diesel locomotives are about the best 20 years have had, at least the expensive ones have had alternating current motors doing what you had to have DC motors to do earlier. They could, they're very, very efficient at low speed. And that's the, that's the thing about diesels, they're basically efficient at low speed. Whereas it takes a steam locomotive to be efficient in high speed. And the problem with electrification is that we're uh, You're done. Thank you. We're, we're, we're going to get another uh, one of these uh, electromagnetic discharges that's going to fry up the, work all the power grids. You gotta be careful about frying your electric grid. <laughs> All right, thank you again, Walter. You're welcome. I've seen the number of your things. I know what the time and effort that goes into these. A little bit, um, at least the just the efforts of taking a, a good number of those photographs, or trading or securing them, uh, it certainly takes an enormous amount of time, and then scripting it the way you do. I had my cat do it. <laughs> uh, let's see, Be, um, jump around there. Uh, the first thing you need is, is to reside or design or live, and it's not just land values, that's rather a pedestrian way of looking at this. You have to live in a sustainable, sustainable community. Uh, I've often remarked in this little configuration here, how this is kind of a strange place. Somehow it just doesn't appear to me to be a community. There's intersection traffic and things like that, but um, that's getting to the point. Um, that's really going to be the valuable place where you want to live. And urban planners are beginning to seriously look at that now. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, next thing is, I'm sorry, I don't think burning more fossil fuels is the correct energy policy. 
Even though you claim, Walter, that there's some technique for capturing the waste product or byproducts and using these again and things of that nature, I think we really got to look all together. I mean, I had the program here where we had the train system with solar cells serving as a roof overhead for the system, I think would be a much more innovative and 21st century approach. Um, I have to credit Bill and I have to agree with him. I don't think we should be going back to 200 year old technology. Uh, and I'm sorry that burning, like steam engines were incredibly inefficient <laughs> and burning stuff still is not very efficient. Even though you, I mean, I mean, it's a good idea. You keep your power source in one locale. You can control it instead of having one on each vehicle. Uh, the way I think you had to go is megalith uh, and possibly even monorails. Of course, there's problems with that because the monorail is, is, is confined to one single track. There's no switching or without complications. Uh, I think Bill's ideas certainly need a lot more thought, though. Uh, they're not tested or proven or developed in any extent here. Bill's monorails um, can be switched. Hmm? Bill's monorails can be switched. They're not like the other. I, I meant his technical details. I, I won't get into it. He's got about one page, and that's about it, if you really go into detail. You need a little more than that. Otherwise, it's just a lot of yada, yada, yada. And if you ask them about it and things like that, but I don't want to get into that. Whether or not CTA cars, uh, I don't know if regenerative braking, that's an old technology, whether or not it's going to generate a lot of, that's interesting, I didn't know that. But if you think that it's going to generate power, that's cool. Increasing a gas tax and making automobiles, uh, driving a car. Um, there was a proposal by the one environmental organization to raise a gas tax by a few pennies. I think it was going to amount to about $25 tax on an annual per vehicle. They said it would have no chance of getting through the legislature. Mm -hmm. Making the price of automobiles, parking, whatever. Uh, you could put taxes on tires and all kinds of things. Um, that's not going to get people to use public transit. You have to make it attractive. You have to get them uh, portal to portal type transportation. Uh, you've got to have things like you just can't take seats out of trains and say this is going to make it a much more pleasant experience <laughs> standing up in a crowded car for an hour. You can't have dilapidated stations. People, for one reason or another, to me, I could care less. To other people, it's important if you're going to attract, if you're going to take your babe out on Saturday night, you know, you can't go through some of these stations that were constructed, you know, in the 19th century. Uh, but anyhow, you can't put an onerous, you can't make cars unattractive by this taxation and things like that. Um, regarding driverless trains, I must say that anybody who's had a train set as I do, can, I've operated several trains at one time by myself. I don't have little engineers oh. in each train. Oh. <laughs> I, I must admit on the initial time I might have had a few accidents <laughs> and things of that nature, but using positive train control, centralized <laughs> train control, I can operate this system here. And I can do it at home. <laughs> I can do it on a larger scale without these these uh, heavily unionized. <laughs> right. Wait a minute, what kind of deal did you get from your employer? What kind of fixed annuity is he going to get? You? <coughs> What's that? What kind of fixed annuity is he going to get? You got a pension plan where you work? No. You got any health insurance? Well, no. Or garbage no. stuff. Let's just smoke. Let's Oh, you got a deal. No, this is the race to the bottom. He That's why it. your old stuff has no attraction, no appeal to me whatsoever. You're promising a race to the bottom. Yep. I got it. I'm worthless. You may work for minimum wage. You offer no nothing positive in your world. Why, why should I embrace it? I'll take his union world. 
you got a benefit, you got a pension, right? A yeah. nice one. You put a family through, you're able to provide for your own. Yeah. What do you offer? Nothing but severity. Yeah, right. Austerity. Yeah. Keep it. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. Um, yeah. Bring in your own face. Oh, Walter Collins is doing his final it's, rebuttal. Come on up, Walter. I brush padded down here. By the way. Metro gave me this pen last week. Ideally, oh, it's still good. to solve our transportation <laughs> problems is what's it been going on for years. Final rebuttal time. It's called innovation. Innovation. It's already been up here. It's going to be Time for the final rebuttal. We so have it. Get, yeah. get up here for the tomorrow final rebuttal. So you can yeah, shut yeah, me up. Wanna... All right, I'll bring yeah, you the microphone. Uh, uh, the, microphone. the innovation's all being done on automobiles. Be the oh, yeah. time. Uh, Joe mentioned the track gauge taking the truck off. Uh, there are some, I can't remember offhand which countries, <laughs> where they don't take the trucks off. They can actually change the gauge without through. Yeah, there's a, not very much of it, but the, there is some of that. Australia, perhaps. No, this is in Europe. I can't remember exactly. Right. I think. Could be. Uh, Crushing the, crossing the Russian border. Crossing the Russian border. The Russian border, uh, yeah, Russian border. Adam said. Uh, one thing I know from working as an apprentice electrician, working on the L and getting lots of shots, AC burns a hell of a lot less severely than DC does. <laughs> now, for Bernie, uh, I don't know about the snow room on the IC for high voltage. I showed a shot of the Acela train at South Station in Boston, and that 25,000 volt wire was right above the roof of that train. And uh, another thing, uh, oh, this degenerative braking. I hope CTA has taken the precautions that Toronto learned to take. You have this train coming along, putting power back in. It's generating power, putting it into the third rail. It's only one little problem. The train breaks down, they're working on it, and they, they cut the uh, power off of the uh, disabled train, and they feel nice and safe. Along comes the next train generating power. They do the same section. Zap! Yeah, that's the problem. I, don't, I wonder if the CTA has really dealt with that yet. Knowing the CTA, I really wonder. And Bob, as far as the pensions go, there is a pension problem simply because they just didn't keep paying into it like they were supposed to. And monorails. You know how the CTA runs. Would you like to be hanging on the goddamn monorail train to train <laughs> down? Yeah. And come on, folks, we're going to walk to the next station. Just climb up on the roof. And uh, no, so. you can keep them on with Maglev and uh, when you're in the induction. Yeah, there's a lot of them pushing that. That's kind of dying out. Uh, that's not so hot with a lot of ice and snow over it. So, so that's all I have to say. What so, about the cat and the catenary? The cat and the catenary, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to see you. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing? Hang in. I've got no thyroid. What the hell? You don't have to have everything. Oh, really?